G'day guys, welcome to Sydney, Australia. Um, you may not have seen me before because usually I'm making windsurf videos. However, um, under the circumstances, I thought let's do something a bit different. We'll do a podcast. Anyway, I'd like everyone uh, out there to welcome my special guest star, Simeon. Simeon Glasson. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Simeon Glasson from the IWT, the International Windsurfing Tour. Uh, Simeon, well, you just live just not far from you. Yeah. This What's is this on? is Maroubra, which is uh, one of the southern coast beaches of Sydney, and uh, Paul lives down here with this amazing outlook and really great spot. I live, um, unfortunately, not at the coast. I live more in the city, and uh, so I miss all this coastal stuff. And it's a pleasure to come down here. Yeah, so um, it just so happens that Simeon lives in Sydney because when you think of windsurfing, you know, most of the action's happening in Europe. Mm. So, um, but on, in Australia, uh, you've got quite a few keen windsurfers all over. Most of them are in Western Australia because of the conditions. But along the east coast, from Queensland down to Tasmania, um, there's, there's quite a few super keen windsurfers actually, and we get pretty good conditions. But, um, so yeah, you anyway, know, super cool that we're here. Yeah. And uh, it almost didn't happen because Simeon, we well, were supposed to do this yesterday, but Simeon woke up with a sore throat and went and got a test and you're negative. Yes. Thank goodness. We had a super fast turnaround on the test. I got, got the test yesterday afternoon at seven o'clock. I got the results. So that was yeah. great. Yeah. So that's, so that's no pestilence. It's super cool. So I thought we could start with maybe just giving a bit of background to who you are how you got started in windsurfing like yeah what, how well did... i just got started like the rest of us did which is uh, you know i was a kid i had some dinghy sailing experience a little bit and i uh, was introduced to windsurfing by a family friend and just thought this was amazing and awesome and then my parents and their fr friends of theirs who are jessica crisp's parents put the two of us together because we we're obviously driving them crazy respectively and they said, go off and get out and sort yourselves out with all your energy. So we started sailing together non-stop, non-stop. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. So where, whereabouts did you live? Um, over in Sydney Harbour. So oh, right. she had whereabouts on Sydney Harbour? Watson's Bay and Cuddy oh, Beach really? and things like that. So I'd run down to her place and uh, she had a boat shed on the water that we could keep some stuff in. And we'd just go sailing all the time, non-stop, wow. after school. Weekends. That's super cool. Yeah. And then Jess Chris obviously went on to be, well, she became a world champion, didn't she? She well, got pretty good, yeah. She, she, she got 23 world titles. Oh, really? Five, that time, means... five times at the Olympics. Yeah, and right. uh, won the professional uh, world title overall once and won the professional uh, wave sailing title and won at Who Keeper. So, yeah. That's she, super she's cool, done hey? pretty much everything. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And then... Like, I have a memory, we talked about this before, but I have a memory of you when I lived, well, actually, when I was growing up, the, um, that's, the TUI sponsored team. Oh, yeah, we, we were the TUI's so, blue yeah. serving team. Yeah, maybe you could just have a like, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, that awesome. was back in the days when, um, we had a, over on the West Coast, we had a big slalom tour that was run by a guy called Quentin Little and lots of other people helping out. And it was an amazing tour that attracted people from all over the world. And so I, after high school, I'd gone over there to be a part of all that fantastic scene and it was just loving it and uh anyway we were trying to get sponsorship and support for the events and this and that all the usual things and uh, quentin came up with the idea of a team might be more marketable so we picked three guys um four guys and uh, put together a team and branded up the sales and two is blue one of the beer companies decided yeah, yeah. that was cool anyway it was an experiment it was fun we had a good time doing it because it, like when i was growing up i mean windsurfing was more visible in the media mm. nowadays in australia especially you don't see windsurfing much you know in the media but back in those days you yeah it seemed to be a bit more mm. possibilities with that sort of stuff isn't it really i think that's true yeah I, I, the sporting the media sporting landscape is a bit has changed because media has changed so much and it's always been that the big sports have dominated and the smaller sports have not but uh now the big sports are almost owned and so integral with the television stations, even more than they yeah, used to be. Yeah, yeah, true. And so they've got a vested interest in pumping that product, and they've got a vested interest in the sponsorship deals that go around, all that sort of stuff. So it's just that much harder for smaller things to crack in. Mm. And the interesting thing about watching the um, media landscape for sports in the US is that there's kind of a, a top five group of sports that dominate all the sponsorship 
and everything else, and they get all the good deals because they dominate the media landscape. And all the sports that are under that have a very hard time cracking into that scene. And that's been fascinating watching um, WSL try to crack into that top five. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't know what WSL is, that's the World Surfing League. Mm. Basically controls all the surfing competitions and the professional uh, professionals out there. How did you get involved with the IWT? How did that? Or maybe you could tell us also how that you know started. What like what's the, the mm. basis of that? Yeah. Well, the IWT now started as a single event um, in Oregon, the Pistol River event in Oregon, USA, and it started with Sam Bittner and Russ Ferro, who were young, super enthusiastic windsurfers who'd moved to Maui or super passionate, and they thought, okay, let's go into competition, and then they realised there were no competitions on Maui anymore, yeah. for whatever reasons, and there were almost no competitions in America for wave sailing, and almost no competitions anywhere in the Pacific at that time, and they thought, well, that's no good, so they decided to just start up and make one happen. And the old one that had been fantastic fun in the past, they brought it back, which was this Pistol River one. It's a fantastic, hardcore series of a place on the west coast of the US. It's really wild. And uh, anyway, they decided to run an event there, and it was a big success. Everyone was equally starved of action, and so they all, everyone descended on it from all over, and it was a really big event with some serious high caliber people. And Anyway, so that was the beginning, and then that got them and everyone else excited, so that they expanded for the following year, and they called it the American Windsurfing Tour, AWT, yep. and they added a bunch of events, California, Mexico, and, uh, and Oregon, and it just then expanded into Peru, and it's just been expanding and expanding ever since, because there's such a hunger for this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, especially over there, there wasn't any PWA events, obviously, was there? It was all, it's, everything's very Europe-focused, isn't it? Well, Europe and Maui. Basically. Europe and Maui. Yeah. Uh, Europe has all the um, hardcore, large numbers of people, and mm. therefore it has the money. Yeah. Maui has the sort of um, incredible conditions, and everyone travels to it, but it yeah. doesn't have the money. Yeah. Because it doesn't get the media support around the wider community in this whole a Asia Pacific area. It doesn't yeah. really focus on that stuff. Yeah. So this hemisphere is very different to that hemisphere, and res and competitions have evolved accordingly. Yeah. Because I think that's. I don't know how many people are going to watch this, but I think that's one of the things that sometimes you forget is you're looking at everything from your own perspective. Sure. So, like when you're sitting in Australia with windsurfing, you know we're essentially on a big island here. You know that windsurfing is happening in other parts of the world, but it's not like a massive sport here. So you kind of just view windsurfing in that framework. Don't mm -hmm. you? It's, it's like ah, it's limited possibilities. You just do it for the fun of it. You, know, you do it for the love of it. You know. But then you see these videos on Facebook or YouTube and stuff from Europe, and there's obviously a lot more opportunities. I mean, it's not that it's a huge sport like uh, football or, or something like tennis or anything like that, but you can see that there's, you know, they've got sponsorships um, on their sales and um, just more professionalism. They turn up in these massive vans and all like stick it up and, you know, this sort of stuff. So you get this impression that was obviously more going on over there mm -hmm. and all and all the wave images you just get from Maui obviously so you kind of see that as a bit of a center of the wave sailing or windsurfing universe but uh, yeah it's interesting what you said mm -hmm. yeah yeah but. yeah it's fascinating um, and I think like you say the different people's perspectives it's it's hard to see the other perspective so because the sports so big in Europe um, and it has been since pretty early days uh, and it has retained a very high level of cool factor so a lot of sponsors still want to be involved in it. It's a lot of the big names like Philip Costa, they're, they're actually genuinely household names in Germany. Like yeah. that's not a made up thing. Like yeah, really yeah, people yeah. know him. I heard, yeah, yeah. And because uh, he's awesome. But Germany has this incredible power about windsurfing. They have this cool factor that they see it um, yeah. embodying yeah, yeah, for yeah, themselves. Yeah. A bit like surfing, maybe even cooler than surfing in some ways. Mm. So that's that's how it feels over there. Yeah. And, and from Germany as an epicenter, it sort of bleeds out and then Europe has this sort of very powerful bubble, um, which uh, that's where everything happens. It's where the money is. It's where the industry makes its yep. money. It's where the people are and all sorts of stuff. But there are people all over the world who windsurf, yep. you know, yep. and passionate pockets everywhere. Like we go yeah. down to a really remote, weirdo part of the coast on Chile, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and here are these incredibly good sailors who've been sailing for years that nobody knows about. Yeah. And these brothers called the Fabres brothers, as, as one example. There, there are a bunch of other people down there, but I mean, these guys are really good. Probably yeah. good, but yeah. they just don't. They're all over the world, aren't they? Yeah, you go to a local you go. spot and they'll be. It's, you do it for the fun. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the idea of being a professional sailor in Australia is laughable. Yeah. I mean, the people who are the best here, other than um, characters like Jaeger, who is 
you know, really one of the best sailors in the world, without any question. And he's in the European scene very strongly and very strongly associated with Severn brands and Starboard brands, which have really great bases over in Western Australia. And some people know that, but I guess a lot of people probably don't know that that's where they're based because they're so their presence really is p super powerful over in Europe as a media thing. Yeah, true. Yeah. And how are you feeling? Because this is the first time I've done an interview. How are you feeling? Have you eased into it? Well, the tea's really good. Yeah, yeah. I've laced it. It's, have you? Yeah. Right. So that's, that's that, that licorice enough. thing. I can really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you like licorice tea's pretty yeah, good, it's isn't really it? Good. It's one of my favourites, actually. Yeah. What's your involvement now? Like, how does it? Yeah. Well, where are you at with it? Um, I now. I bought the tour from Sam Bittner, Sam Bittner Wilson. Um, she started it at an official thing, partner, partnership with Russ, but the business was owned by her. So um, she decided she wanted to, it was time for her to pull out. She wanted to start a family. She's got this awesome kid now. They're having an awesome time. Anyway, so I bought it from Sam and now I run it in partnership with Russ. Yep. And um, so we're, we're just, you know, super into it. And I got into it at all because of my friend Jessica again. She got an invitation to go and sort of um, show her face and uh, perform at the Aloha Classic when the PWA came back and did it in 2014. And I went over there just to be, you know, thumbs up on the beach. And uh, yeah, right. that was awesome. And I really couldn't wave sail very well. And I hadn't, I'd, I'd done slalom and racing and stuff all along. Yeah. Anyway, that trip t was really great for me because I'd spent 25 years running businesses and like flogging myself and you know, ra raising a family and stuff. Well, one daughter. Um, and for me, it was just a holiday, but then it turned into 2015, went back, went back again, more and more. And then I started to go on tour in 2017 and just loved it. I couldn't believe how good it was. I, yeah, right. I really couldn't believe how much fun I'd been missing out on. In yeah, the yeah. So I just changed my life. Um, shut down my business to a large extent, wow. started up other things that I could. You were an architect, was it? Yeah. 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 Architect yeah. doing developing and different things. And I was involved in a lot of environmental causes, like yep. helping starting up the Climate Council and running a lot of programs that were pushing environmental energy with government levels and working for the Sheikh of Dubai for a while, so urban, eco urban design, because I yeah, right. blah, blah, blah. Had a lot of fun, yeah. but didn't do any windsurfing. And uh, anyway, getting back into it was awesome. And the IWT was my first opportunity to really see how good it could be. So finally go to really good waves and just go, oh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah, different. Yeah. yeah. That's not the same. Yeah. And so that's what got me into it. And then I just got along with everyone really well and, and was really passionate about it. And then the opportunity to buy it came up and Sam was keen to step out and yeah. I just decided to step in. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, shout outs to Russ Faro. I met him um in Peru and um super nice guy. You know, he was telling me how he's one of the best wave sailors in Maui. And um no he didn't he didn't actually <laughs> But um, no, it was actually really interesting. I'd never really uh, met many people from Maui before. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I went to Peru uh, last year. Russ is very good, by the way. I'm not laughing at Russ. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a sense of humor. I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> but um, no, basically, um, yeah, I went over to Peru last year because uh, Simeon basically gave me a call. He said, oh, we're doing this event. And um, he'd known that, you know, I've made some of these uh, windsurf videos. He said, I'd be cool. And yeah, I didn't have to think about it very long. I thought, oh, it'd be super cool because uh, some of my mates here would tell me about Peru. And so I went over there and um, yeah, I met some of these guys from Maui and some of the pros. In, in Australia, you don't, well, especially on the East Coast, there's not a hell of a lot of that sort of action. So, but um, yeah, that was interesting. Interesting to, to sort of to see a bit about that. So, all right, so I guess. Um, that's how we know we now know how you got into the IWT. So, mm. how long have you been doing it for? Um, doing the IWT, uh, I, I bought it from Sam at the end of 2018 season. So just after the Aloha Classic 2018, that's when we changed the business changed hands. Yep. And so I ran 2019 as my first season running it with Russ, and we tried to do a bunch of things, and it was all good fun, and you know I invested some money and quite a bit of money. And I'm um, building up <laughs> the marketing and, and uh, doing all sorts yeah. of stuff, and so, and that, which was great because we got uh, we got some good prize money which I put up um, to try and sort of energise and and help the top guys afford it, which over this side of the world is a pretty significant problem. Mm. Um, so we got the talent over here, but not the money. Yeah. So we wanted to try and give them something to help them get around the tour, and then we wanted to really ramp up the media to try and get the interest from the corporations and whatever whoever might sponsor it. 
And and we got huge numbers and in massive increase in people who are following it and seeing it and who are aware of it. And that was all really cool. And then, you know, we had this wonderful battle. We made a movie with Jace, Panabianco and Poor Boys Productions. And they, those guys are freaking awesome. And we had this incredibly good thing to film, but not just the tour and the locations, but yeah. this incredible battle between the top guys, yeah. which started out as a, a thing between um, Bant Rodiger, Morgan, and Antoine. And it was just so close, and then Bant sort of just just got edged out and really got between Morgan and Antoine, and it was yeah. so close. Antoine won the first two events, and then uh, Mo Morgan won the set next two events, and they went in to the final uh, close. Morgan had not come second or third in, in those early ones where Antoine won, but they were very close. And really it came down to one had to beat the other in the final. Anyway, in the grand final we had this wonderful outcome. This, which you couldn't write it better for a script, you know, it was perfect movie making stuff. Yeah, right. And of course Antoine won the tour and won the Aloha Classic when he got a chance to you know, come up against everyone in the world. Very impressive. Um, ultra awesome finals and incredibly high standard at the Aloha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Super exciting. Yeah, that's one thing I sort of took away when I saw some of these guys in Peru was just like how good they actually are because yeah, yeah. you see the videos and you think, oh yeah, I mean, you know it's impressive to look, but uh, it's another thing to see in person. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the thing I took away from it was, well, there's probably two things, was their timing and their just control. Yeah. You know, like you, you know, when you're wave sailing, I find one of the hardest parts is timing. You know, like it, it, there's not a big window between hitting something too late or a bit too early. Like yeah, you know, split seconds. Yeah, so. and like especially some of the waves aren't always perfect. It could be a bit crumbly here and there. It's hard to sort of read. But um, yeah, when I saw Camille, Morgan, and Antoine. Oh no, yeah. Oh yeah, Antoine. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Because I thought you, you used to call him Tatoon. Oh, everyone calls him Tatoon. Oh, oh yeah, yeah Tatoon. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, was just how precise they were. I mean, they don't. They sometimes eat it, like it's not like they make every single thing, but there's a high proportion of makes and also just, um, yeah, just really good timing. That's it's super interesting cool. watching them when the pressure's on too, all of those guys. Oh, yeah. Like um, in the final, for instance, between Morgan and Antoine, Morgan had just come off the back of a semi-final where he'd beaten his, you know, long-time rival and very good friend, Camille. And Camille was on fire all the lead up to this, like he was just blitzing it. Yeah. It was so impressive. He was pulling super critical. When I mean, we had logo high waves, it was pretty perfect. And and Camille was pulling pocket 360s, like yeah, just yeah. sick stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks super awesome. And we thought Camille was going to win the event on, on form that yeah. we'd seen up to that point. But that's when you see, that's when we saw Antoine just shift a gear. Yeah. And he just, he went nuts in that semi-final. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah he he went went awesome. Absolutely nuts. Well, the other thing that's interesting about those top sailors too is that they all have they, everyone's got their own style. Because like you think, okay, if everyone can do a, a good cut back and a, you know forward and a back, like you just think, well, it, it must all look kind of the same. Mm, no, but doesn't, doesn't. you can actually see, mm. like for me, Antoine has this um, super controlled, but like just super controlled and just like smooth, like smooth sailing. Mm. And Camille just like seems like suit. I mean, I keep using my control, but he just like whatever he puts his mind on, like he goes, I'm gonna do this on that. He'll think about it before and just does it, like mm, doesn't mm, it? Mm. Like it's it's just like everything just seems so easy. Like you, you look at it and you just think, all right, of if all, I just did that one move, of I'd be all stoked. of those guys, and I'd include Matt Rodiger and Levi and a few others in that crew, they're all very good surfers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but of all of them, I think Camille might be the best surfer. All oh, right, okay. And uh, I think his style and his Little aggressive surfing. read of a wave is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. But when you come up. When he comes up against everyone else, it doesn't always mean he's going to win. No, nah, sure. You know, I mean, it's a bit looser, isn't it? Like yeah. it's, not, it's not as like you know, I mean, not like pro style, if you know what I mean. Like it's just more. One of the things that you can see with the riders, I think, is is that um, it's their mental attitude going into a heat. So they've all got very high skills, and as you say, they've all got their own style. Yeah. But sometimes you'll see one of them is just switched on. You know, mm. like in that semi final, Camille was blitzing it. Yeah. But I said, like I said. Tatoon just shifted a gear, and, and it, there was a kind of an aggression and a, and a ferocity about the way he was going about it, which yep. made his moves just look better. Yeah. And it was something special. Yeah. Having said that, he put all that energy into beating Camille, got into the final, and Morgan got him. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. But Morgan got him. And so Morgan, it was yeah. It's this amazing scene. And I was going to say, you know, Morgan was the other person that was just mm. so good to watch. He's like, 
you can tell he's a really good surfer by the way he sails mm -hmm. um yeah it was super sick i think yeah you, you touched a good point you know this is something for me i want to improve my wave sailing i feel like i'm starting to improve a little bit over the last few years but um i think probably the area that i could spend a heap you know more, way more time is just normal surfing you know because if you if you get good at surfing you just read the waves and you're also using the power in a different way because you know on a windsurf you just go down the wave you can do a big bottom turn in the flats and you've got the power in the sail to keep you going you try and do that on a surfboard and you just you just you just kill your speed and like you're just working a lot more with the wave so good little yeah. tip out there if you want to get better at wave sailing put yeah you know, spend more time surfing i think as well yeah and the good people are, are good surfers mm. really good yeah so um yeah okay so now we're here in 2020 mm. and we have <coughs> effectively in my mind correct me if i'm wrong two main avenues to compete on a sort of international level yeah. there's pwa events and there's iwt events yeah so, well that's for the wave sailing scene yeah so, yeah. so babe, i just want to also clarify something mm. you guys only run wave sailing events there's no anything else true or, well when when Sam and Russ were building up this um, seri these series of events over here that were the AWT and turning into the IWT, they were experimenting with all kinds of things. I mean, so for instance, at one stage they were running some freestyle events in um, the west coast of the US, and they were also involved with the Hatteras competition, uh, which was a wave sailing competition for a while and then turned into a sort of slalom long distance thing. Well, and the slalom long distance thing is, well, it didn't turn into that, it always had that, but that's a fantastic event. Lots yeah, of okay. participation. Lots of people from all over come to be a part of that. So that's a really cool event. And, you know, we were doing all sorts of things. And Sam was also involved in the Maui race series, the Slalom series there for a little while. So when I took it over, I thought, I think we need to sort of have some more clarity about this brand. Because if the purpose is to try and um, bring a bit more cash in to sort of make it a bit more slick, to pay for a bit more media, to then a virtuous cycle to build it all up, then we're going to need to look like a particular kind of thing, like an identifiable kind of thing. So I looked at what, you know, what's our best thing, and without doubt our best thing is that we go to these incredible wave locations. And then I, th I looked at the success of the WSL during that time over these last few years and realized that the branding that they had really suits this hemisphere better and is good for us to follow. You know, this is Australia, Japan, the Pacific, North America and South America, and this is where the WSL has its major roots, mm. and this is surfing, and this is a surf culture. And that's kind of our vibe, that's our thing. We, we don't have the other thing as much. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, there's still a lot of it, but our particular niche where we're really good is this wave thing and our wave locations. Yeah. So we picked that up and went through, we really ran with that in 2019 and that's kind of what we're looking to take forward. So the one thing that we're looking to add, um, I think next year for fun, is uh, some wave racing. So people can take their wave gear to these events and then, if you, as long as you don't try and bring all these like mountains of slalom gear, just on your waveboard and on your wave sail, whatever, yeah. you're, whatever you're using the competition, we're going to run some Le Mans start uh, wave yeah, that'd figure be sick. Eight things. That'll be hell fun. It'll be really fun, and I think it, I think it adds to the events, and it adds to all the participation and enjoyment. And it's great when we have wind and no waves, which occasionally we do. And in those times, you think, well, we could do this, and this would be really fun. But we don't want to turn it into equipment race. We just want it to. No, be no. Fun. No, just the gear that you wave sail on, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that'd be super fun. Yeah. And people will be turning sort of uh, thrusters into single fins and <laughs> yeah, maybe, turn maybe. quads into to twinses or something. Maybe. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, that's um. I mean, that's just an added thing. Our, our real thing is the wave riding. No, no, no. But I think yeah. like that's the thing in windsurfing is that when I think of windsurfing, in my mind, I just think good times and fun. I mean, that, why else are we doing it? Right. We're well, certainly mean, not doing I mean, it for the money, that's well, for sure. Yeah, not, yeah, well, that's right. I mean, obviously there are the elite level pros that sure. it's more of a, uh, you know, they've got something to work towards with that. But for 99.9% for .9 of windsurfers, you just do it because you, you, you love it, basically. Yeah. And, and like, you know, it's, I think um, windsurfing could improve in that area a bit when it comes to social slash event style. You know, if it's all just serious, serious, serious racing or like, just serious anything, well, you know, there's a lot of people out there that that's not why they're windsurfing, yeah. you know, so... I well, think, I mean, yeah. different things have different importance, right? So, for if you're, if you're a pro sailor who lives in Europe, let's say you're one of the legends over there, you know, you're Victor Fernandez from, from Spain, you're a big wheel over in a big place, and you're yeah. going to get some sponsorship support because, you know, you're a big guy. 
and Philip Costa, huge guy in Germany, he's going to get some good sponsorship support. And these guys can make, you know, not they're not getting rich, they're not driving Ferraris, but they're doing they're doing okay. Yeah. They're making a living, and they can do that over there. But if you take someone who is similarly talented, like Morgan or Bant, or you know the the Wave Riders, more Hawaiian based, there's no money over in Hawaii for that sort of stuff. Mm. There's no international sort of vibe going on at the moment. Yeah. So those guys, um, they they live on the smell of an oily rag. They only do it because they're passionate about it. Mm. Um, but they're super passionate about it, and they have enough support from the industry. Like it's not like they get none, but they have enough, and they create a, a brand and a vibe which is largely leveraged in European markets more than mm. it is over here because yeah. the markets here are so much smaller. But the idea for the IW2 is just give opportunity to these guys. You know? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the cool. purpose, and and to anyone else. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point because. You have all these amazing wave sales. They've got very limited opportunities, especially on the well, the PWA scene. The Look, moment, and, and at the uh, moment, right? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't give the PWA a hard time. I mean, no, no, but I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they... No, no, I'm not giving them a hard time, but you know yeah. what I mean. Like in yeah. wave sailing down the line, there's not a lot going on. No, when, when they come to Maui, they obviously get that great event, and that's really good. Um, and they have the jumping thing, which you know I, I wouldn't want to put down. That's seriously awesome. I mean, the Pozo is astonishingly yeah. oh, world class yeah, any right. any level of extreme sports that's that's a, yeah. that's a big one yeah and then you know you, uh, you've got Tenerife which is pretty cool and then you've got uh, Silt which is just a rugged and crazy which has its own appeal but yeah you're right I mean the, they want to do more down the line wave riding just like we do yeah their limitation is that they've set themselves a, a bar to to get over which is a very high bar of money mm. uh, for prize money run event, yeah. running events so it's cool that they have those very high standards, and it's good that they're looking after that top end of rider. Um, it's just doing that has consequences. It mm. limits what they can then do, that's all. Yeah, and I guess that's where you've been able to get into that market, so to speak, because your entry barrier to run an event is a lot lower. I mean, you know, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to, to put it in really crude terms, we've got a very low business cost model, and, and that is necessary in this half of the planet, mm. or, or the majority of the planet. Yeah. Um, so if we weren't running events like this, then events wouldn't be run. So of course it's good to run events like this so that you get events. Yeah. And then that gives opportunity to all these amazing talents who are out there who aren't trying to get a big paycheck from a thing. They just want to have an awesome opportunity to ride. Yeah. They, they're so passionate that they've become very good. Like the guys in Chile or Peru, or Argentina, or Brazil, Western Australia, you know, East Coast Australia, Japan, all these places that aren't part of the main scene, but still have incredibly good talent, like mm. wildly good talent. And um, just as an example, so a bit of an aside, we rocked up to Chile and Bant had come out of Japan looking seriously like like a rock star. And we're thinking, shit, he's just burst back onto tour after all these years <laughs> doing all this stuff. Watch out, you know? And uh, anyway, he goes through his first heat and it's like, oh, awesome, like seriously ripping. And his second heat is sailing really well. And some local guy who we don't know, beat him oh yeah wow. and he came into the beach just going <laughs> wow yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> wasn't expecting that yeah you know and that's, yeah, what, it, that's what it's about like, yeah I know. You know? Oh, but every area has got them we have them here yeah oh no it's, it's interesting i mean there are guys down here that you know they can do super sick turns and yeah but no one really knows much about them and, no yeah no, no one knows yeah. them at all yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you know, name name the top five guys on the east coast like who would you say what not three or four wave sailing yeah Go on, make some enemies. <laughs> All right. Um, no, that's a good question, actually. Problem is, I don't know, oh, you know many wave sales from, uh, say, Queensland, but obviously sure. Queensland, yeah, well, it's called different New conditions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or Victoria, for that matter, or Tasmania. But uh, look, um, from what I know, top. All right. Um, geez, that's a good one. Is that, do they have to live here? No. Oh, so they could be elsewhere. Well, I mean, I guess um, Ricky Vandertorn would have to be up there. He's not bad. Well, he's from New South Wales, isn't he? Originally. Yeah, you may have heard of Ricky Vandertorn. I just remember that name back from the day. He was well, he was this it. tiny, skinny little kid that came on the windsurfing one design scene when, he, when we were still doing that a long time ago. And, um, and he was brash and funny and, yeah, clearly talented. And he got into wave sailing. He got really, really good. Yeah. Like, seriously good. Yeah. yeah he won the Margaret River. Um, a while back. And yeah. He's, he's proper good. I've never met the guy, but I've heard of him because um, I've got some mates at Margaret's and mm -hmm. he sails, or he lives down there, he sails down there, but apparently he shreds. So, mm. 
He obviously is very good. Obviously, there's guys. I'm not going to talk about guys in Western Australia, just the East Coast. Um, yeah, then um, I guess the next one that comes to mind would be uh, Brett Goodwin. Brett's serious. Brett player. Goodwin in Jaroa, who was a kind of like a semi pro or, or he something. Went, he went to a couple like, of the big events in the back 90s in the or something yeah. in Maui. Yeah, yeah. And um, he can do some of the best turns, like, yeah, I've seen. Um, yeah, he's very good. Yep. Then. Not a fan of competition so much these days. But doesn't seem but to be. Very, very no, good. I filmed him in quite a few of my videos. He's like, he's really good. He's, he's like, he's one of those guys that just, he'll turn up in his car. You don't really hear much of him. But, you know, it's not like he's, you know, going out there trying to sort of say anything to many people. He just turns up in his car, rigs up, goes out and just is the best on the day. Just, you know, he's just, just, the, he's best. just the best out there. Like, yeah. he's, okay, just yeah. throwing goiters down and, um, yeah, like he's really good. Yeah, super good timing. Like he'll hardly ever fall. Like mm. he, like he just hardly falls. Yep. Basically, like you, you know, hardly you never see him swim in the water. And like sometimes you'd be around Jaroa and you're thinking, ah, oh, there's bloody sharks around or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I am in the water trying to water start, and you think Brett's been out two hours. He's never fallen in. Like yep. he just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, Brett's one of those guys who, if if the full world tour came here, one of these major international events, like an IWT event, oh like, yeah, came down here, brought everyone. And no, no, one, no one would know Brett. He'd be like, well, you better watch out for him. Well, he'd be like, he'd be a danger to take anyone down. I, he I, could I, take I think, down anyone. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, especially if it's yeah. down the line. Just well, wave sailing. Yeah. 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 I think where, where we lack here is the jumping. Like, you know, because in we just don't get the conditions often um, where you just get, you know, you can just plane off the beach. Yeah. It's more like cross off, cross, cross off kind of conditions, which is a super nice luxury, but it just means jumping is, it, it's limited. And it's a bit gusty. Yeah, we and, don't have and we just, jumping spots here. Yeah, yeah, and we also just prefer, if you've got really good waves, and then you've got down the beach a bit onshore, you, you're always going to choose the good waves, so you just basically don't put a lot of time into jumping. Well, you look at the you look at the <clears> surf <throat> culture that we've got on the east coast yeah. of Australia, and it's that's kind of who we are, it's our DNA, it's what we all imagine being a part of, Yeah, and it's where, the way most of us grew up, like most of us grew up having a surf, you know, like this, just walk out here and have a surf. Yeah. And then the people who learn to windsurf, you, you do it on flat water because that was what you did, and it was and that's super cool, racing, and it's accessible and all sorts of stuff. But if you can get to the level where you can go out in the waves, yeah, it's just not a jumping mentality. Like you're not, that's not what you're aiming at. You're yeah. aiming to ride those waves. Yeah. yeah. No, that's it. That's yeah. it. Finish off your yeah. um your your top five. What I have: Ricky Van der uh, yeah. Brett Goodwin. Then for a, for a tide of third. Um, you don't put them all in order. That's a bit rough. Is it? Oh, okay. Just put them all in a bundle. Oh, I see. Easier. Okay. Well, the other one would be um, uh, Michael George Westra. Mm -hmm. um, if I didn't put him in the list, like he'd, he'd beat be, you up. Well, he'd be yeah. pretty angry. Because um, <laughs> no, I know George, George is no, seriously he, good. Yeah, he's, no, he's, he's a ripper. He's very good sailor. Yeah. And uh, I've learned a bit from watching him. He's yeah. really good. And uh, yeah. yeah, no, he's he's really good. Very good timing. Very powerful sailor. Doesn't um, mind a crash. Yeah, he's yeah. <laughs> if you want the it's best wipeouts, then you just watch George as well. Um, yeah, but, but no, um, he he goes hard. He he really hits him. Yeah. yeah, no, he's very good to sail. It's actually really good to sail with people better than you because sure. yeah, it's just something to aim for basically. And um, and that's yeah. a big reason that I think competitions need to include the best and everyone else because um, it inspires everyone else. And it gives the people who are the best a kind of leadership role in supporting and encouraging everyone else, whether they mean to or not, and they're just by example they are. And so it's just this fantastic combination of, um, you know, it's a virtuous relationship and, and rela events that can do that for everyone. That's terrific. It's yeah. like including youth fleets. Yeah, it's, it's very open. Yeah. From all levels, you can all mingle. Yeah, it's it's not, that's the good thing about windsurfing, isn't it? It's not, it's not elitist. I mean, yeah. well, some sports you just couldn't get anywhere near the, the stars. You know, it's just like they're all behind security or something. Yeah. Whereas in windsurfing, you, you're having breakfast and you're sitting, you know, the world champ sitting right there, hey, how's it going? Everyone's, you know, it's just like, yep, whatever. Super they just, at the end of the day, on that level, you're all equal in the sense that you're just there because you love windsurfing. That's the thing. Like, okay, one person's better than the other, but at the end of the day, you're both having as equal as much of fun. Yeah, So, exactly. like, who really cares? Exactly. Oh, without cares, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, at the end of the day, you're experiencing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so... Well, the heroes love a crowd to cheer them on, yeah, and then and then everyone else loves a, a hero to inspire them. I mean, that's a great great combination. Mm. So, it, back to this top grouping, would you include Forrest? Well, actually, let me just finish this. So, what about Ricky Vanderton? 
Oh, Forrest, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Sorry, Brent, Brent Goodwin, <laughs> Michael, jo- uh, Michael George, West George. Just, we just call him George. Yeah. George. Um, Dougs. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll just call him Dougs. Everyone calls him Dougs. But basically, uh, if you're on the East Coast, you'll know who I'm talking about. And even you might know of him in Maui because he also was kind of semi-pro or pro or whatever in Maui back in the 90s or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's awesome. Super, really good sailor. Um, does super sick turns, like some of the best turns. Um, very good timing. So yeah, and then yeah, okay. The, the fifth, I mean, I can think. Look, the thing is, I can think of a few people. Yeah, that well, really this good. is the thing. Look, yeah, Forrest exactly. Ladkin. Oh, look, five, um, five is an abstract number. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have to yeah. probably have to mention Forrest because he's the one of the legends of Jiroa. Yeah, he grew up there yeah. and won quite a lot of comps. Actually, yeah. he won one of the Peru ones, right? Well, was he, he he took out Peru. He beat yeah. some pretty bloody big names when he went over to the event over there. Yeah, because yeah, we came second. I've forgotten what it was. Was it Camille? Did he beat or something like that? It wasn't Camille that year, I don't think. But one of the top, like elite big, pros. He, yeah. he beat some big people. Yeah. No, but yeah, Foz yeah. is a super sick sailor. Does, yeah. He does huge aerials at Jaroa. Yeah. And he's a good bloke. Was, mm. Yeah, he's a super good bloke. Uh, yeah, and look, there's other guys mentioning Sam Dillon, mm-hmm. Dunk, Dunk mm-hmm. Sauce up there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's other guys, it's quite eight, a few. Yeah. Uh, I've probably forgotten quite a few, but they're, they're the main ones. Yeah. I might actually, I've, I put it out there on social media that you were coming and um, I basically just asked you know, if anyone's got any questions for Simeon. So I, I might just um, segue into this. All right, I've got a question here. I don't know his name, but he's known on Seabreeze as Axi. Axi. Um, okay, so the question is, how do you reconcile the need to get the riders to compete in the best conditions possible, IWT, while drawing crowd and sponsors, ah. PWA? So, yeah. Um, um, how do we reconcile it? Uh, well, actually, before you go on, sorry, can yeah. I, I'll finish off, because I'll just sure. read exa- everything yeah, he said. Yeah. Sorry. So it says, my personal view is that the IWT is a nice, ideal view of the world, but not practical. Nice for the riders, but ultimately too far from the public and the average windsurfer. I understand riders' frustration with the PWA and having to compete in silk, but attracting crowd, public, ad, and media coverage it is the sustainable way for windsurfing competition. Plus, in my books, if you can't compete and win in crappy, not ideal conditions, then why should one be a challenger for the best windsurfer in the world? Anyway, it would be good to have his views on the question. Mm, good question. There are two questions there. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, in relation to the first part, which is how do we justify not having crowds, and why is that? I- is that still a good thing, or is it just a boutique, you know, indulgence, essentially? I think the answer to that is um, that if you want the highest level of competition to really find the best wave riders, then you you're going to have an easier time doing that on the best waves. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is if you have the best waves, you attract the best wave riders. And reason number three is, once you've got that combination of great wave riders on great waves, you can film that and it looks much, much better. So in, the, in terms of the question about um, how does it impact the, the public and keep the sport alive and lots of stuff, look, this, the public isn't gonna be very interested unless it looks good. And so that's the main factor here. Like you've got to take great talent and put them on great waves and film it. And then you can make it digitally available. But what the WSL showed was, I think, that crowds are good, but global digital crowds are the best. We would love it if we had um, 100,000 people show up on the beach, as has happened back in the mid-80s in you know, Holland and Germany and places like that um, for the big World Cup events in the early days of the sport. But that doesn't happen now anywhere in Europe, and it doesn't happen, and it hasn't happened for a long time. Mm. And that's a combination of the world changing, and it's a combination that's got a lot to do with the digital world, making making it very accessible without any of the hardship. So people don't have to stand in the freezing cold on the beach. They don't have to stand in the wind blasted sand even on a warm day. They don't have to fly uh, around the world to sit and watch something. And because they don't have to, they don't. So they're not going to show up in mm. the same numbers that they used to. So it's a, you're chasing diminishing returns if you're chasing crowds on a beach for this sport. 
If you're chasing crowds in a stadium for soccer, you're going to get them. If you're chasing crowds in soccer for football, you're going to get them, or any of, any number of those other major league sports. But if you're chasing some um, some attention from the world, you've got to show them a spectacle, and the best spectacle are the best riders on the best waves, in our opinion. Um, so for that reason, that's that's what we want to do. Apart from that, we just wanted to ride these waves. Now, the debate then comes down to, does the money matter? Does it matter if this thing makes no money? Now, from my point of view, not really. I don't particularly want it to lose money, but it doesn't matter if it makes money. And we've got this super low cost thing. Yeah. We're working with event organizers for whom there's a direct benefit in the riders going there. So we've got, um, uh, you know, so for, it's, it's, it's a self-sustaining thing. You go down to Chile and the Ch Chile government, the Chilean government, uh, the tourism government is supportive. You've got the local hotels and businesses that are supportive and the same model is throughout. So it's not as though there's no money involved, that there's no logic, no financial logic. There is some logic to, to it. But we're really keen on this digital market. We think that's the future and we think that's the energy that we want to have. And we want to provide the best spectacle we possibly can for that digital market. Yeah. Okay. That's the idea. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Because it's also, you know, to get the timing where the wind conditions and wave conditions are right, having people all come and not necessarily that pleasant standing on a beach getting wind blasted. I mean, the, the reality of getting big crowds at a wave sailing event is going to be, mm -hmm. it's going to be a bit of a pipe dream, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I, I think guess so. Windsurfing is not, it's not easy to get people to the beach. I mean, and it was different yeah. when there were fewer sports and less on TV and, yeah. and live. Yeah. It was more, you felt more connected. But that experience is, different now yeah it's just not the true. same problem yeah, yeah, not yeah. same issue i guess the other thing too is you know they'll come it's the chicken and the egg thing crowds will come once the profile has has gone up you know so so if they if, if they're if they're learning about it through digital media then when another event happens mm -hmm. they might actually be more interested at that point you know maybe, so maybe but, yeah, yeah. Exactly. How, it's, else, it's, how else are they going to learn about it? They're not going to learn about it any other way, really, are they? I mean, well, this is the thing. I mean, we, we, we're dealing with, we're not dealing with the sport at its peak. We're dealing with the sport on a, on a rise from a low place. So the sport had a, had a dip and, is, and has been in a dip. And from what we see, we see the grassroots and we see the power of it coming back. Yeah. I mean, there's a, the biggest youth generation in a generation now coming through yeah. well, across the whole world. It's not just in Europe, but it's not just over in the Pacific. Mm. Um, this is a, a universal sort of experience and it's, and it's a new wave that's coming through and the talent is strong and the pool is deep mm. and this is a very good sign. And on top of that, the numbers of social media, the numbers that we're getting for being followed, uh, like all the other things, uh, they're going up. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an upward trajectory, but the trajectory is measured more easily and is more impressive when you measure the digital traje trajectory. Not when you measure bumps on seats at a, at a non-stadium, wind-blown sandy beach somewhere. So, <clears throat> anyway, it's a long-winded answer to the to this guy's question, um, but that's the strategy that we're employing, and and it's the strategy that the WSL has employed. The same thing, they stopped trying to go to the big local popular places uh, in favour of the perfect places because the digital world allows them to do that and still deliver yeah, the content. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 And when I bring that up, a lot of people say, yeah, but you know, the WSL is a bad model to follow because uh, the, you know, they're losing money. And it's like, well, yeah, they're spending a bit too much money. We're not, we're not spending that sort of money. But as a concept to follow, I think it's a good concept. Yeah, you no, need definitely. A, need better financials around it, but yeah. So I've got a question here from Tim Williams. So he's also on the East Coast here. Sorry, uh, I don't think I answered the second oh, part of that question. Oh, question. sorry. Right? Sorry. So uh, what you already, yeah, I'll read it. Uh, basically... Um, He's, oh yeah. If you can't compete and win in crappy, not oh, ideal yeah. conditions, then why should you one be a challenger for the best windsurfer in the world? Um, I just don't agree with that premise. I, I just I, I respect the idea that someone who can sail in shitty conditions and be excellent is very impressive. I respect that, but that's like saying a Formula One driver if they can't drive around the back streets and pick up milk and get home in time, they shouldn't be the best in the world. So. <laughs> What? I don't get that. I don't get the argument. I don't get the premise. No, I, no, that's I, funny. I really do respect yeah, yeah. and appreciate people who can sail in shitty conditions very well. It is very, very hard it to do. It would be a good race, though. It would be great. Like, race. I'd watch it. Yeah, I'd love to is see that? those guys take those cars <laughs> around these streets. You've got to get a, yeah. you've got to get a carton of milk and get back. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and if you can't do that, yeah, I yeah, don't I don't know. I don't see you as world champion. No, for sure. I so mean, look, I, I, I think that's a complicated question, and uh, uh, trying to work out who's the best. 
does very much depend on the frame you're putting around yeah. what the best means. I but but as a maybe a, a midpoint, you know, a, a, an ideal scenario would be you'd have, you know, say you had seven or eight events during the year or something like that, and five of them were in sick waves, and one of them was at Pozo, mm. and one of them was in Silt, mm. and mm. one was in Tenerife. Like that way, you, you've you've got you got some um, comps there to um, yeah. for the jumpers. Yeah, for people, you know, a bit onshore -y sort of stuff, well, and that way you get more balance, maybe. Yeah. Like for, you know, I'm just thinking if you were to have an overall world champion or something. I think that's the best thing you can do for an overall, <clears throat> and and I think in that context, for instance, I wouldn't call silt shitty conditions. Oh yeah. I, I'd call silt wild storm. Like it's a it's yeah, a, yeah, it's yeah, a sure. psycho location. Yeah. And the people who can sail well there are very 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 skilled. You know, that's incredible. Um, and you've got specialists in storm sailing. You've got specialists in jumping, and you've got specialists in wave riding. And it, we are we are a sport that has people excel in different things. Yeah. So like in tennis, you someone's good on grass, someone's good on clay, someone's good on you know whatever. Yeah. Every sport has people who are better in slightly in each of the slight variable conditions, and our sport is no different. And I agree that an overall world champion needs to be able to perform across a range of conditions. It's like um, our wave sailing tour uh, for you know has three that go left and three that go right for 2021 yeah. because obviously you need balance. And uh, we have two jumping ones, Japan and Pistol. Okay, well, that's, that's not too bad, but it's two out of six. The other ones yeah. are moderate jumping or, or a little bit, not really. Mm. So you, you then compare that to say, well, if, if an overall world champion were to be doing those events plus the events in Europe, then, all right, well, that'd be a good overall champion. Yeah. That'd yeah. be serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which is why we don't claim a world title. Mm. You know, like we don't, we're no, not, we're not into sure. that. It's, we yeah, agree, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah no, that's, yeah. Um, that's all fair enough. Yeah. But it is interesting, isn't it? Like, I guess in a, in a way, a big part of the framework is already there to make a complete tour. Because yeah, you know, you mentioned Silt, Pozo, Japan. Like, you you could have it all mixed back, a keeper, and then some other good wave spots, and all of a sudden you've got a really varied mix mm. of uh, spots, haven't you? Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, the the pro the only thing that I would say about that is that um, my my preference is to watch wave riding. I just yeah, that's sure. just gets me going more. For sure. So but just to be fair to people who are better jumpers than um, than, than wave riders, I guess you've got to give them some chance to. Of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 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 Yeah, and I hear what you're saying. There's, a, there's a big discussion, for instance, I mean, rightly or wrongly, there's a big discussion around the idea of um, should there be two titles, like a wave riding and a jumping. And I'm pretty disinclined to start setting that sort of stuff up. I mean, I'm speaking of Jimmy Diaz, chairman of president of PWA. And he and I both thought, oh, well, that's the last thing we all need, like another bloody world title. And I agree with that. Like, I think it's great if we can pull them all together. But um, until we could meet, for instance, the sort of prize money things that the guys yeah. in Europe are expecting, um, then that's not going to happen yeah. very easily or very yeah. well. So, you know, our objective is to try and see what we can do over here without prize money, without le that level of prize money, just keep building up. Now, there's a good chance that we'll get up there. But for us, it's not really about the prize money. For our riders and for all the for all the wave sailing scene and for, and for the sort of surfer scene in general, it's helpful, but it's it's not instead of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are talking big, huge bucks, are we? Yeah. Ah, no. All right. So I've got a question. So yeah, we're happy with that answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tim Williams from okay. East Coast. G'day, Tim. G'day, Tim. Top bloke, actually. Yep. Top bloke. Um, Tim um, helped run and keep going the uh, Wave Sailing Associations for a very long time with a lot of dedication and time, so top, top shot. Nice work. What are the judges looking for in down the line wave riding? I promise I'd do a silly answer to this and then a serious one. Uh, I can't think of a silly one. So um, we're looking for the things that we describe, but you know, Tim, and everyone who's been involved in judging and running contests knows we're looking for. Um, critical, speed, and flow, and read of the wave, um, and you can, you know people use different words for all this sort of stuff all the time. Blah, 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 blah. But essentially, what you're trying to find in a down the line contest is someone who's reading the wave really well, and that includes choosing the wave. Yeah, there's a very big difference in performance c potential on different waves. So, for instance, so some people say, oh this rider or this person got lucky because they got that wave. It's like, yeah, lucky. I don't know. I've been out sailing with that person. They get lucky a lot, you know. So I think when people are very, very good, they get luckier and luckier. So they tend to choose the better waves to perform on. Yeah. And that's quite a big criteria for then being able to do a lot on that wave. It doesn't necessarily mean the biggest wave, but they're choosing the one that's got the best shape to give the best performance. 
So once someone chooses that, they've then got a great canvas to work on. And then it's all a question of how they're reading that wave. So for instance, if, if you're reading a wave and you say, I could do three moves on this wave, and, but I'm just going to do one, then the judging would be like, that was a good move, but you could have done more. Like you didn't read that wave all that well. Um, so we won't give a high mark for someone who just does one big wonder. Like they'll do well because that's a good wave, but they could have done more. Mm. And then you do the thing of uh, how critical is it? Like there's a huge difference, for instance, between here's the wave and the pocket right there, and here's the shoulder. Now if someone does something really sick here, is it really sick? Not really. Mm. If someone does something and gets up into this pocket, like perfect, perfect timing, mm. that's the place to be. Yeah. And if they're a metre and a half or a metre or two metres off that spot, it's less good. It's not as critical. That, like, that difference no, no, is sure. a huge difference. Yeah, the comp I mean, yeah, it's a lot, the, the, the risk of, of stacking goes up a fair bit. <sighs> yeah, huge, yeah, yeah, huge, yeah. huge. So when the guys are making even a top turn or an aerial um, or you know, some of the 360 moves, if they're doing it here, it's worth much more than yeah. if they're doing it even a metre and a half away from that yeah, spot. Yeah. And that's, that's all about timing, precision, and just power, raw power, risk. So, yeah, and then if they come out of those things clean and into something else, then that's good flow. And if they can read all the potential and sort of line something up saying, okay, I, I don't want to go too hard on this first one because that second section is going to be the better one, then we're giving them good points for reading that stuff. Yeah. So as much as you can read all the rules and regs about, you know, these are the things you're supposed to do, and we all try to write all that stuff down, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. And then there's this sort of thing that I was sort of referring to before where you see a certain sort of ferocity in some of the riders some of the time. And it it just brings out a more powerful performance in those riders. Yeah. And so that ferocity is hard to describe in words, but you can see it. You can tell when it's happening. And and one one of the great riders might do it one heat, and they might not do it, do it the next. But that's that's that kind of um, attacking fluid power and 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 just synchronicity with the wave. Like they're yeah. really in sync. Yeah, yeah. That's when it's really impressive. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, getting into the pockets a key one, isn't it? Because um, it's very easy to go shoulder hopping, when you, well, especially when you're learning. You know, you, that's just a safe place to be. You well, know? that's where you should be when you're learning. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah. and then, but then you you stay there when you get better sometimes because yeah. you just think you get used to it. It's such a habit, and like you realise you can actually, you know, get deeper into the wave. There um, are a lot of riders um, who come back into the beach upset with their marks and their scores, and quite um, quite uh, adamant that they should have got a better score of this and that. But when we show them the video, which we usually have these days, where we can do a video review if, if it comes to that, yeah, it's nearly always that they're not nearly as close to the pocket as they, they thought. They think, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. No, good, good points. Mm. He just Tim sort of goes on to mention he's trying to get better at judging because mm. he's doing some judging down in South Australia. So I, that just makes me think, you know, if someone wants to, you know, become a better judge. I guess there has to maybe also be a bit of a, a framework as a as a guideline because you know if some guys are not thinking like you are they're not really concerned about the pocket and you know they're judging down there mm -hmm. and a whole different mm -hmm. framework so you know maybe getting some universal broad um, agreement as to what what constitutes good you know, you know like not good but you know what I mean like well I think the, the, the stuff that's issue. written down like the PWA rules that, that are written down are all have all been hashed out by all the top writers oh, okay. over many years. And that you read those and they're really good. Okay. And our rules are, we, we do it in fewer words, but uh, it's the same idea. Okay. And I think the whole way of approaching it has been fairly well written down. Okay. I think what, what is hard to do is then take that written knowledge and mm. turn it into assessment. Because it's hard to assess ferocity. It's hard to really be sure what is the pocket and, and how... After a lot of experience of watching people, you can know where someone could go. Yeah. And then you're watching yeah, where they do. It's a bit too, isn't it? It's yeah. a lot. Is it on your website, the judging criteria? Yeah. Oh, it's all there. So, so anyone who's organising their own local comp, they could mm -hmm. go to that as a bit of a framework. Yeah, if you like, go to the IWT website and you mm -hmm. go to the About tab and just click on the About tab, and it then throws you a um, ton of information about yeah. the tour and what's going on, and then at the bottom end it shows all our criteria. Oh, that's cool. Um, that's a good resource, isn't it? Yeah, and, and anyone can use that. And we've got brackets and things that people can use for, for competitions around the world if they want to grab those things too for free. If everyone wants to grab one. So we're talking about um, George before, Michael George Westro. So he's come up with a question. Uh, why aren't transitions scored anymore? That's an excellent question, George. We always love the... Oh, uh, sorry, the, before you go on, the, transitions, 
you know, referring to you know, turning around in case you're not familiar with that word. Right. Yeah. Jiving, tacking, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, honestly, I don't know when they stopped being included, but I suspect it was uh, the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it was fun watching people get scored for these things. But I think in the end, the reason that they were taken out was because they just, the, the, the impact of a transition compared to the impact of a wave ride or a great jump was so insignificant that we thought, I think we'll just, just focus on the wave running and jumping. You know, it's funny, isn't it? It's funny, but it was, but, it was kind of cool when they were included. People were doing jump but, jibes and duck jibes and one-handed this and 360. <laughs> but I was just thinking if you brought it back in, like what would happen? Because like yeah. right now, most of the time people are just tacking. And falling like, off half the time too. It's or like falling funny. off, I mean, you know, it's not like, it's either a tack or a jive. This is basically two things, but I'm just thinking, you know, all of a sudden you'd be thinking, you know, it all just turned into freestyle. Like, yeah, but know, the freestylers just, would get a definite oh, post. Definite post. Like it's, um, yeah. yeah, it's funny. It's yeah, funny maybe we should actually. bring it back. I know, we'll talk God. about it. <laughs> all right, that's another thing to learn, man. Was, yeah. Okay. Um, so, my other questions. Um, so I got Marito Nunes. Nunes? Mario Nunes. Yeah, yeah. Mario. Oh, Mario, I said Mario from Chile. It's Mario from, uh, from it's Chile. It's hey, Mario. A R I T O. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. That's is that it? Mario? Is that? Oh, okay. Hey, Mario. Sorry to not pronounce your name well. Um, so he's saying, could you uh, could you ask something about the best spots of wave sailing worldwide, especially Portac? Seasons, how to get there, conditions, etc. Mm. Yeah, okay. Well, um, Mario uh, lives and sails in Matanzas and Topacama in Chile, which are two of the best port tack places that you'll ever find. But the other port tack places that are outstanding are Pacasmayo and Peru, which is where we go. It's a huge, longest rideable wave in the world, which is epic. It's fun when it's small and it's a crazy, wild, impressive when it's big. And the same with Topacama in Chile. So those are two extremely good left-handers. And all up the south coast, the west coast of South America has left-handers just boom, 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 the whole thing. But those are the two prime spots. And then um, we get over to Western Australia and we've got the left-handers that run boom, 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 all the way up that coast. So from Margaret River, well, from Esperance, up to Margaret River, some uh, other ones, some, you know, south of Perth and north of Perth, Lancelin, Geraldton, um, and then Nalu, of course, those are some of the best lefts in the world. Nalu would be, uh, like, that's world class. Really, it's super hard to get to, it's a pain in the ass, long trip, super hot, flies, a lot of things you've got to get through, but Nalu's got to be one of the best in the world. A wave that I haven't been to yet, but, yeah. uh, but uh, Margaret River is one of the best. Um, yeah, those are really good ones. The right-handers that are best in the world, I mean, everyone would go to Maui and Cabo Verde. Uh, but mm. Baja is also one of the great rides. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think. It's like, and then it's not like there's hundreds and like you know, if you think in your mind about where the good wave sailing spots, it, it's it, it's kind of limited as well. Like in a way, isn't it? like if you want really, really the well really good yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, really good stuff, isn't it? It's like you can wave sail up there anyway. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, there's, I mean, Fiji, of course, cloud break. Yeah, and then the Mo Nomotu breaks are epic. They're, so they're mm. world class as well. Mm -hmm. We're trying very hard to get ourselves back into that spot. I was actually just talking to Tourism Fiji this morning. But, oh, yeah? Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, right. But um, then we've got... Uh, uh, what was I going to say? I don't know. Like, it just... Yeah. Uh, there's Chalpo. You can sail Chalpo. I mean, Charlie Boyd. Mm. Hey, Charlie Boyd. Um, he has sailed that place and has had some sick wipeouts on that wave. Like, just nasty. And he... One of, these, one of the entries into the IWT big wave was him doing an insanely beautiful bottom turn on Chalpo. Yeah, right. Stunning. Big wave. Not a wave that was big enough to beat the Jaws waves in terms of the big wave contest, but super impressive, it's critical crazy, power. Crazy. So, um, thumbs up, Charlie Boy. Yeah, it's hardcore. Impressive. Super hardcore, isn't it? Yeah, but the wind in, in, Ty, in, um, in Tahiti is not really reliable enough for us to run a reasonable mm. seven-day window. You know, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the problem yeah. with quite a few of these places. Jeez, what, r running a wave sailing comp at Chow Chowpoo would be just a little crazy. Bit be crazy, eh? <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> but it's because it's it's tricky if it's small or it's big. Oh, I guess. Well, well have you got Camille yeah. has sailed there and ripped it. You have got um, Cowley Siadi, I think, mm. has just gone fully nuts there. Yeah. I mean, he put his. He had a terrible injury. When did you see this? He got sort of caught up in a foot strap or something. Well, wasn't it? he he was doing. He was just ripping and getting deeper and deeper. It's a fully crazy guy. 
incredible skill. Like Cowley's one of the greatest ever. Yeah. yeah. But he did one um, big aerial off this sort of super sucky yeah, hollow yeah, limb, and that. anyway, he came down. And his foot went through the board badly. So it's a place to watch out. Mm. That, I do remember that clip. It's super gnarly. It's super violent. All, everything happens so fast, mm -hmm. and it just I don't know how he just didn't break apart. Basically, yeah, indeed. He's lucky he got off with um, only that injury. I think. Yeah. All right. So moving on, Jamie. God, I don't, this is bad. I don't pronounce everyone's names. Coelho. Coelho. How do you pronounce his surname? I'm not sure. Sorry, Jamie. I just know you as Jamie. This is another local you know, guy that I see down in Jaroa all the time. Yeah. And I'm never saying his surname, but it's spelled C-O-E-L-H-O. -E Coelho. Coelho. Yeah. Anyway, Jamie, sorry about that. When is the IWT holding an event in Australia? Well, we've got, um, we've got an event on the 2021 calendar. Um, that we're going to be going over COVID dependent um, in early February to Margaret River. And that, that event, uh, if COVID allows, will kick off the tour for 2021. And if COVID allows, it will be the Australian national titles. And uh, the guys over in Western Australia, Phil Cutter and Jane Seaman, who are heavily involved in running all the events through Windsurfing WA, so thumbs up to you guys. Um, they ran, they've run that event before, and they, they ran it earlier this year, and it was really, really impressive. They had yep. big swell, it was super powerful. So we posted a bunch of that content, which we thought was really amazing. And that led to us being in touch, and they showed the IWT movie, and it was all very cool. Anyway, the guys over there are very keen to, you know, invite everyone around nice. the world to come over. So yeah, well, well, that'd be cool. We just hope that COVID allows us to get there. Mm -hmm. um, it'll probably happen as an event, no matter what, um, but if, if all of Australia is allowed to travel to WA, we've got COVID restrictions between states at the moment. Um, but if we're all allowed to go over there, then it will be a national title with support from all the groups. Um, and if we're not, it'll just be an event. But the idea basically is that that's the kickoff event for the tour for next year. And um, because we're worried about COVID in the first half of next year and travel, we're making each of the events on the Wave Tour a standalone event. Um, so that you don't have to go and do an overall because we don't want to risk everyone's traveling. Yeah. So we've turned each of our major events Australia, then um, Japan, Omazaki, uh, Topakama, Chile, um, Pakes Mayo, Peru, and then uh, Pistol River, Oregon, are all going to be national titles for waves. And then the best from those people automatically qualify into the grand final, um, the Aloha Classic, which has been the IWT grand final ever since Sam started it up again in 2012, 2011. So if we can get that event going and COVID safe for everyone to travel, then at least we've got a seeding, a process for, to qualify into it so that we can have this elite group of people. And then we've got wild cards and, you know, we might be able to partner with the PWA again if we can pull the money together. And, uh, but either way, it's going to be a big grand final with a COVID safe start. So that's the concept. So yeah, the event in Australia, long-winded answer, Margaret River. Cool. Capri. Well, that's a good spot. Yeah. Very reliable. Mm. Okay, that's cool. Mm. Um, I've got a question from... Craig Sinclair from, um, well, Sydney, well, not Sydney, but New South Wales. I, I don't think this question needs to be answered, but it says, what scores high on a wingding? <laughs> um, wingding, for anyone who doesn't know, is um, well, basically wing foiling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, obviously, you know. Uh, uh. Well, I, I think wing foiling looks like a lot of fun, and, it's, and everyone's playing around with it, and it's giving everyone a lot to do during COVID, and the people who are really good at it are super impressive. Like, seriously, amazing. I think we're, yeah, it's, it's pretty th cool. there's a good chance that we're going to pull out, or a bunch of people are going to pull out some uh, foiling wing things at Pacas Mayo next year oh, yeah. for the longest way. Yeah. And I think we might have some fun with it there. So we're, yeah. we're keen to include those sorts of things. So I doubt that's going to become our core competition. But No, I can see the appeal. In certain conditions, it looks super fun. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's just, it's good for windsurfing too, because even though it's a different thing, people will just, chuck it all in the same basket. It yeah. is all, it if is if all, anyone yeah. doesn't know, like, oh, if it, an extra person wing for is just another face in the sport, isn't it? Right, it's exactly. Like, yeah, it's exactly. cool, it's cool. Yeah. And probably good for their businesses too, the windsurf businesses, or something else for them to And the, to wing, get the wing thing is, has started to work. I mean, they obviously tried it all in the 80s, but back in the 80s, we had way too much friction with the board on the water for that mm, kind of a, yeah. a foil yeah. Yeah, in the air to really power it along. But now that the foil is allowing people to get up and reduce friction, then this really lightweight thing works, isn't it? is enough. And you, that's, that's, a good, that's a good combination. Yeah. All right, so moving on. Matteo Petricone. G'day, Matteo. Petricone. 
There's another surname, I don't even know how to pronounce it. He's Italian. Matteo is also basically an Italian that's come to, you know, moved to Australia. He loves wave sailing. Mm. Is there any plan to promote wave sailing windsurfing for kids and young guns? I barely see young people doing windsurfing. Yep. Um, in Australia, we have not seen too many young people windsurfing for a while. We've got some youth, but not a lot. But I've got to say that around the rest of the world, um, it is strong, uh, remarkably strong. Okay. Um, at our IWT events and at the PWA events, um, strong fields. The strongest field for the youth right now is in the Pozo, thanks to the twins, um, Dida and Nabaya. They've um, encouraged, supported, nourished, and nurtured uh, a strong group of kids over there, yep. as has everyone else, but they, yep. they brought it into their big event. Yeah. And uh, they had you know, a very rapidly increasing number of kids participating mm. in that event to the point where it was putting enormous pressure on the whole infrastructure of the event yeah. to try and get everything done and manage it all, and it's just, it, uh, it was tiring everyone out. I know that head judge Duncan Coombs was starting to feel pretty frazzled with so many more heats and like, it was really a lot to manage and uh, everyone's excited about it but it's a whole new thing to manage. Mm. So the twins have been great promoting that, it's very impressive and that's been super successful. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that event became 60, 70, 80 plus kids you know, as soon as we can get back to it. And then also over in Europe, um, Tenerife has a similar sort of really strong youth field which is great. Um, you're not going to find a bunch of youth going out at silt, way too nasty. Not, not the ideal thing, but those other events are strong. And then this year, um, the guys who are organising, uh, Mads and those guys up at Denmark, good on you guys, have worked with the PWA to organise a youth event. And we really hope that Clip Moller can run that thing with the COVID situation, because that would be just really cool. Yeah. The, the idea of seeing more youth-only events uh, looks like a real possibility. Yeah. Is youth just under 18? Or what does um, that mean? There are a bunch of different categories because there are so many youth competing over in Europe at the moment. They've got a range of categories. They've got under 13, 14, 15, 16, blah, blah. Um, uh, and also the categories in um, IWT started out as under 21. We've been gradually pushing it down. It's now under 20 and yeah. we're aiming to make it under 19. So an 18 year old really should be a youth and after that, not so much. Yeah. And that lines us up with most of the expectations in most sports. That 18, you're a youth, 19, no. But we, we're progressing toward that, and the reason we have to progress toward that is because we had so few youth, as Matteo said, over in this part of the world. But where it's strong in this part of the world is Japan, um, Hisa, and a bunch of the other people from the Japan Windsurfing Association have been putting in years of effort to um, teach kids. Yep. And I've got to say, that's a, it's the biggest single focused effort to teach young people and bring them into the sport that I've seen for decades. Yeah, right. They focus on kids in high school, um, some in primary, but mostly high school, and they focus um, heavily on kids in universities. Wow. And down in the Omazaki region, with these guys putting in all the hard work and not getting paid for it, I mean, this, this mm. is all off yeah, the bat. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, hats off. You've made yeah, a that's very, cool. very that's big impact. Cool. That's wow, a really wow, big deal. Wow, wow. And they don't have a few kids. Like, they've got 50 kids wow. showing up to um, a wave it's camp. so good, isn't it? Yeah. 50. And then over on the west coast, not just Omazaki, they've yeah. got another thing with, with Yuma and other guys over there, Yuma Itiabashi. Um, another 50 kids will show up to a web camp over there. So, I mean, they, they've got serious that's, numbers. Yeah, that's cool. Really big. Japan it's it's the only way windsurfing is going to survive and thrive. You know, right. you don't get the young kids in. It's right. yeah. not, not a lot going on for the future, exactly. is it? Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, it's super cool. And then we see other places like in Peru, um, Jaime uh, Ojas, mm. who owns the resort there. He encourages any youth that come along in the region. I mean, yeah. he, he, he plucked uh, William uh, Perez out of obscurity and taught him how to do it as, yeah. a, as a kid. And William's now like champion awesome. of Peru, is mm. super impressive. And I think Jaime supports any kids that come along like that. He's, he's always mm. really cool. Like uh, even my daughter, when she came over and she was learning to wave sail over there because it's the, the perfect place to learn to wave yeah. sail. Um, he was super supportive. He said, come anytime, family, you know, like that's what he's like. I mean, he yeah. would support kids really well and he has. I think down in Chile, um, Conditions are a bit harder to learn, but there are a lot of kids who are learning. Mm. Um, you've got a, got a bunch of kids over there. And then you've got uh, the Lemonuzzi family over in Argentina who are supporting and teaching tons of oh, people yeah, yeah, over true, in the big lake where they have That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And they're doing really well. Yeah. And up in Brazil, you've got heaps of people, especially up, um, well, all along the coast. Yeah. You've got Cali Ciati's new resort, mm. Club Ciati. And then you've got, uh, I don't know, Jerry has just massive, massive numbers of people, yeah. kids all the way through to adults yeah. and age, yeah. age of people doing it and then you know the one place where it isn't really happening is Australia and so 
I think when you're here, it feels like it's much smaller than it really is, mm. um, because we we just don't have a system going here. Yeah. And I was talking with Jessica about this, and she's working with um, you know Yachting Australia and the, um, all the all the efforts to sort of get kids from dinghies, like from uh, various kinds of dinghy craft, where the kids are getting into it, up into windsurfing instead of just disappearing from the yeah. sport because they don't want to do some you know yeah. boat. They want to get into windsurfing perhaps. So she's working on a way of just giving them opportunities to do that. Yeah. And that's a really good idea. It's a really fundamental good idea. Cool. Tapping into the yachting thing is always going to oh, be a yeah. good idea. There's so many avenues. Like, mm. Before I go on, I've had about two or three cups of tea. I'm busting to go to the break. bathroom. Okay. So just give me a second. Excuse me. You want to do the snap thing? <laughs> Ready? Oh, yeah. All right. Hey, one, one, two, two three. three. <laughs> cool. We're done. Excellent. <clears throat> that's better. Um, so... <clears throat> Alright, so another question from Matteo. How to get to IWT comps? What's the price? Is IWT helping any way with athletes? Ah, well, okay. Um, well, each of our events you fly to from wherever you are, so airfare, getting your gear there, whatever. Thanks, man. Um, and then once you get to each of the places, uh, we've arranged good deals for athletes. Uh, for so good accommodation deals, good package deals, and you can find out all about that on the website. Um, if you go to um, the Wave Tour and you go to events, and each event has got its little page, and each page of each event shows you, tells you how to get in contact with the local accommodation people, the local organisers, what the, what the lie of the land is, tells you how people generally fly in, what airports, what mode of transports you use to get around. Sometimes there are transfers organised, usually there are, sometimes there aren't. And you just and then it shows you the accommodation place and they're good deals. So it's a bargain basically once you get there. The airfare is sometimes a pain, but yep. the accommodation deals are pretty good actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I noticed that when I went to Peru. You guys did a great job. Well, that's that, that's us working with the local organisers. I mean, this is one of the big things. It's a partnership, right? It's not the IWT doing all of this. Um, we coordinate and we work with local organisers who do all that tough work. Yeah. Um, now, hopefully, those organisers get the benefit. So Jaime runs the El Faro Resort, and he gets the people staying at his resort. But he gives them a very good deal. Yeah. Uh, package include like the week is all inclusive, three meals. It's a ridiculous bargain. It's like fifty bucks for a room and yeah. uh, three meals. Yeah. And uh, in Chile, it's slightly more expensive, but it's not much. Um, all the places, Pistol River's got an amazing place to stay called called um, the Beach Coma, very basic. The fanciest one that we go to is uh, the, uh, the Hotel Serrato in Chile. Super fancy, beautiful quality, everything. Wow. You pay a little bit more for that, and uh, I don't know. They're all basically yes, we do help in those ways. The local organisers provide good packages. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This question's kind of been pretty much answered before, but another question he says is, "What's the scoring criteria?" I mean, mm. yeah, and then who are the judges? Uh, yeah. He said it would be cool to see some legends of the sport join the judges, like Jimmy Diaz for slalom. Well, well you know, obviously, yeah. obviously we're not judging slalom, but. Um, Look, we do have some big names who judge. For instance, if you come and you compete in the um, uh, amateurs, which is an open division for men and women, and then you can compete in youth, masters, grandmasters, all of those divisions are judged by um, the pros on tour, who are you know pretty experienced. So you'll have one of your judges would be Morgan Moirot, one of your judges would be Antoine Martin, one of your judges would be Bant Rodiger, one of your judges would be me, one of your judges would be Russ. Um, so. You, you're dealing with, you know, not so much me, but I mean, you're dealing with big hitting stars of the sport, judging the people who are up and coming, and then also going to talk to them after the event, saying, yeah. after the heat, and they can talk to say, oh, what did I do? Did I do this right? Did I do that right? And they said, oh yeah, this was really good. Here's the score sheets, and look, you did this. So yeah. it's like a, it's like a coaching session from the best people in the world, mm. just for the cost of going the entry. So yeah, true. They they, they get fantastic judging. In terms of then judging the pro heat, where it needs to be really slick, obviously we can't get them to do that. And we get a team of people that are, we're building up who are you know, really very good. Mm, yeah. And that's been one of the things that's been quite challenging to build up, but we're now getting it together. Yeah. Like, it's pretty strong. I doubt it'd be pretty rare that there'd be a lot of controversy over the result. It, it, it's pretty clear often, isn't it? I mean, well, Look, you, you'll, 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 every now and then you'll get a sailor come off the water who thinks it's not clear, who thinks that... Um, they should have won or they yep. should have got through and stuff like that and sometimes things get stressful for them I mean the riders the top riders 
Um, I mean, you don't get any stress in the amateur division or the masters. I mean, everyone is you know, pretty cool. I mean, they're all super competitive, but they're mm. not going to make a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the pros, they're fighting for something. They're fighting for a big title. Mm. They're fighting for contracts. They're fighting for, you know, serious stature in the sport. And, and it's very, very serious. That title is a coveted title. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the guys come off the water occasionally feeling, you know, very charged up. And uh, for instance, last year we had um, in Pistol River, because the battle was so close between Antoine and Morgan, Antoine did a double forward that he landed very wet. And Duncan, head judge of the PWA, who's head judge of the IWT, so we're sharing the same head judge, the same, cha same judging criteria, he said, ah, can't really give him good marks for that because he landed wet. Whereas Antoine was saying, I'm, you know, I think I should have scored more. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't in, pit, in, in pistols well, in the sense that I can't comment very well. I was uh, very sick at home in Sydney, and Russ and Duncan were running the show. But, uh, I mean, if Duncan says it, then I, I just take it. Cause I reckon that's about as good as you're going to get. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. But, I mean, Antoine, he didn't mean anything by it. He, he just assumed that he pulled a double, and, and that was yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, Antoine handled uh, himself actually really well. He, he yeah. was very upset at the time, but honestly, he's a very good sport. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it would be tricky um, because, uh, you know, when you're sailing out there, you, you might think you've done a better job, but then you come in and you've lost. Or I mean, who knows? Yeah, it's tricky. It does happen. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, I don't know, look, people do get um, pretty worked up at times. But in general, the answer to your question in general is usually people, it's not that hard to work out who's won. Yep. Usually. No, fair enough. Yeah. Jason Juretic. Hey, G'day, Jason. Jason. Another legend. How did the IWT decide on the age breaks for the divisions? Why 55 for Grand Masters? Um, it was basically um, the sort of people that we had competing over the last decade on at various events. Um, like a lot of things in windsurfing, we've got a lot of people who are aging, and then, then there was a, a gap in the sort of people coming into the sport, and now, it's, now the feeder is starting again. So there was uh, a gap in people's in the uh, anyway. It's basically because that's how, that's that's where we had the people, and that's the age gap that made sense to divide fleets. Plus, physiologically, um, at forty, you can still charge. Um, Kevin Pritchard won the Aloha Classic. I think he was thirty-nine, but <laughs> that's impressive. Mm. And he was like, it was one of the biggest, nastiest full-on ugliest days and he was charging like mm. he was he was a total wild man yeah and uh, wow. so at 40 you're still seriously competitive like super competitive 45 the body starts to knock on the door yeah, yeah. you know no matter how much you mm. wanted to do something it starts to change a little yeah um, and at 55 you get another knock on the door mm. I mean there's a kind of that, that's your body does work like that no matter how hard you push yeah, it yeah yeah they're just no, not sure okay so to answer your question, Jason, it's it's a question of, of being compressed from the bottom end because the standards that were being maintained at such a high level, like guys like KP, who were just absolutely ripping into a, what would normally be a retirement age, and he was still killing it. So that meant that we had to push the Masters to 45, and then there are so many people, 45 to 50, that we wanted to bring the, ma the Grand Masters back a bit. That's basically it. And now that Masters division, which six years ago was quite hard, very hard. Now that Masters division is absurdly hard. Like, it's ridiculous. There are so many people in that division, 45 to 55. So many people who've, who've gone 45, 46, 47, and that, that new yeah. wave that's come through. Yeah. Oh, seriously. Yeah, yeah, for wow. sure. Wow, that's a, that's a full-on division. So another question from Jason. In, in Maui, at least. That's, that's where it's super competitive. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. No, that's a good. Um, Jason, another question. Why did IWT have to relent to PWA in terms of awarding world champion titles? Well, we, we, we didn't relent. We, we've come into a system where the PWA has been doing it since um, 1995. And they, they have um, the history of running those World Cup events that hand out the world titles. And that goes all the way back to the first Pro Tour in 1983 which then went into, uh, was kind of messy for the first few years, but it was fantastic, fantastic version of messy, super popular and big. But then you got the, um, the WSMA, which is the amalgamated windsurfing companies, formed a group that for a little while tried to run things. And then you had some sort of private entities. Um, Christian Hurley's uh, was 
trying to sell windsurfing into big media and bring in big bucks and we had cigarette advertising and money pouring in and the top guys getting it and the people outside the top guys weren't getting it concerns about where money was going and stresses and all that was cleared up when the PWA under Phil McGain's um, suggestion and then leadership uh, said hey look let's just have a writers organization that runs this you know we're doing the performance we'll sell our performance and we'll get the benefits for that performance and yep. we'll manage all the details in between and all the writers went okay that sounds like a good idea we can all trust that like open book very good idea and it stabilized everything for the sport um, now since the PWA came in the sport had a few years another bunch of years of, of heyday from 95 to say 99 2000 it was pretty strong still and then they presided um, over uh, declines in the industry and it's been tough for them to maintain the standards that they, that the writers wanted and hoped for. And, and uh, you know, full credit to them for holding on to that stuff. So the long answer is that they have done the hard work for years and years and years. Mm. And they are based in Europe and they are um, the link to the money and, the, and all the things that come from Europe. Yep. And, uh, and you know, they know the scene. So what we're starting up, we started up, the first event was in 2010, the first tour was in 2011. Like, you know, we're, we're way starting up late. And uh, when Russ and Sam started the tour, they were just filling a void. There, was, there were no events over in the Pacific Hemisphere, like the whole yeah. hemisphere, there was nothing, yeah. nothing substantive. So that's why it started. And then as it grew, there was, for a little while, there concern that the IWT, um, particularly when the IWT went over to Cabo Verde in 2015, um, which seemed like a good idea at the time. but. It turned out that that was a problematic strategic decision and because the PWA were trying to negotiate with the Cabo Verde government to try and get a full PWA, full World Cup, lots of money event to get it going as they had, had done a few years before that Josh Angulo had won and was a spectacular event, like yeah, all yeah, time yeah. spectacular. Yeah. And PWA and all the riders were keen to have that again and they were having a hard time raising that money with the government because you know Cabo Verde is a small place, doesn't have a lot of money. So when the IWT came in and said they wanted to run an event for far less money, um, that did undermine the PWA's negotiating position on that particular event and did make them all very upset and it was all very understandable and it was and everyone thought they were doing the right thing. The guys from the AWT thought they were doing the right thing by providing an event um, when, when the PWA weren't able to make it happen and the PWA thought they were trying to do the right thing by leveraging up to get mm -hmm. maximum money for the top riders. Everyone thought they were doing the right thing, good intentions all around. But a negative outcome for leverage for mm. money, and so since then we've then opened up much good good dialogue with the PWA. I mean, I'm having lots of chats with the guys on the board, and uh, I've said, look, to keep it simple, at no point us bringing our low cost business model from this whole half of the planet where it makes sense. We shouldn't be bringing it over to Europe, where it potentially and probably does undermine your ability to raise money yeah. for for the top riders. So we won't do that. I think that's the simplest way to handle it. Like mm. we'll do it over here because it makes sense. Yeah. Low cost thing is required. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But over there, it, it causes a problem. So I think that that's yeah, that's, that's a good way to manage it. And um, the, all the guys on the board think that that makes sense. Um, spoken to Jimmy and, and Craig. I haven't spoken to Sven directly. Okay, Sven, good old days, slalom sailing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all just trying to do the best thing for the riders, and the best thing for them is to have the maximum potential to leverage for money to show the top riders. So I want to make sure that they have that. Yeah. And I certainly don't want to, make, I certainly don't want to try and um, challenge them for a world title because that would also undermine their ability to raise money for those riders. Yep. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, that's a simple way to do it. But that's where it's going to be interesting in the future, isn't it? What, where it all, this all plays out, isn't yeah. it? Because nothing's going to stand still. Like, things will change. If, if PWA want to do more wave events, like, you know, it'll it just be interesting to see how it all plays out, right? I mean, well, they're very keen to try and do more down-the-line wave running events. I mean, the top riders are screaming for it, but they're also screaming for a viable, you know, yeah. professional life. That's right, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And those things are, right now, for the wave riding particular yeah. type, it's, it's in conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But overall, PWA raises great money for a series of incredible slalom events. Yeah. They do um, three incredible wave riding events over in Europe, and they're trying to do mm. more, and they will do more. And we've talked about a system of tiered prize money for points, which um, was going to be introduced this year for Denmark, um, yeah. and not. But so that'll that'll help broaden their ability to to have more events yeah. with, with some prize money for whatever. 
but they're in a difficult position. I mean, it's hard to get that money. Yeah. Because I'm assuming the prize money, if you happen to get in the top three or something, just barely, it will just cover you. Yeah, you know, if you're lucky, cover your costs just to be there. Winning, well, winning our World Cup wave event will get you just over four thousand euros. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So which is great. Yeah. But you know, and you compare it to surfing. Surfing is uh, each event, the winner, men and women, the winner gets a hundred thousand US dollars, mm. and the top woman gets a hundred thousand US dollars. Yeah. Second place is fifty-five thousand dollars. Big drop. Still a lot of money. And then, but everyone gets money and everyone gets a lot of well, money. Well, that's the total prize pool on a PWA event, isn't it? 50,000. Right. Is that the minimum? 55,000 US is about 50,000 yeah, euros. You get second. They, they, they yeah. do it in euros. So yeah, that's the whole prize pool, just a second yeah. place yeah. in one. And plus, they've got sponsorships where if they win, they'll get, I'm sure, a, a, you know, a prize for that. And well, well, interestingly, right? the top surfers make far more money from their um, sponsorship partnerships mm. than they do yeah. from prize money, as you yeah. know. But look, I mean, it's not a great example to use in the sense that the, um, the WSL is losing money every year. We, we all have been led to believe, and we all do believe. Um, and I think that the, the fact that the Zips prop it up um, with as much backing as they do is is testimony to their um, faith in this thing being yeah. a good long-term thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they, they've got to address the prize money thing, because it is a bit unaffordable. Yeah. Look, we're not even remotely thinking we're going to get to that level for mm, surfing. No, for sure, not for sure. Happen. But I was just thinking, like, you know, I don't know if this is, needs to be done, but if if this whole, if the windsurfing community wants to grow like a fully-fledged professional wave sailing competition or tour, you know, whether or not for the first few years sacrifices have to be made where you say, so, so, look, there's not going to be any prize money, but you might get free accommodation and maybe will subsidize some of your airfare or something like that. Um, but the the trade-off is is that uh, by lifting the profile of this whole thing, hopefully within a couple of year period, you know, sponsors will actually want to start coming into, you know, you'll have a product to sell. I mean, that's kind of essentially yeah. what you're, I know you're, you're trying to do, but you know, getting sponsorship without the product, it's like, you, you know, have, you can have the product first. Yeah, no, so, no sponsor will walk in on spec with you some, and saying, I reckon we could. Mm. They, they'll only yeah. walk in when you go, I have done. Yeah. Um, so so we've, we've got to prove ourselves and we've got to mm. do that. Now, in the, while we're building it up, what we don't want to do is undermine the, the potential for the top riders and the PWA uh, management yeah. to do the best for those top riders. So, yeah. so we have to be very it's careful that we tricky, don't undermine tricky. that. Our, our whole objective is to support those top riders, not to undermine them. Yeah. No, it's an interesting dilemma. Well, it's, it's kind of, isn't it? A bit of a crossroads. It's not our way. whole objective. Our whole objective is to support everybody. Yeah. But, you know, sorry. No, that's all good. And um, so, okay, so I guess we've talked a bit about what's happening now. What, where, where do you... I mean, obviously, the world has sort of turned upside down a bit at the moment. Travel has stopped and all that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. what do you think is going to happen over the next year or two? Uh, well, I think we, we've adapted our tour for 2020. We've cancelled 2020 because it's a, it's a shit show. Um and uh, we will support anyone who can run an event. I mean, I think Jaime is trying to run a, a regional event, uh, possibly a Peruvian Nationals in October in at Pacasmaya, which would be really cool, but it remains to be seen if that's possible. But we'll support him if he does that, um, and if that's a safe thing to do. Then next year, we've turned next year into a different kind of thing. It's part of a, a, a restructure that we were looking at anyway, but it's, COVID's brought it on. So next year, we're going to have events, uh, Margaret River in February, um, which will be in Australian Nationals, all things going well with COVID. Then Omezaki in Japan in March, then um, Topakama in Chile in April, and then Pacasmayo, Peru in May, and then in June we'll have the Pistol River, uh, Oregon, USA. And from each of those events, you'll, you'll, riders will be competing for national titles yeah. in all IWT divisions, pro men, pro women, youth, masters, grandmasters, and the open like amateur division. And from four of those divisions, from pro men, pro women, youth and masters, riders will qualify automatically into uh, what we hope we can run at the end of the year in October and have international people coming. We hope we can run the Aloha Classic again, which is the grand final of the IWT Tour. It has been since Sam and Russ started it back up. So to get into the grand final next year, you qualify like you always had to. It's always been hard to get into that. But this time the qualification process is more structured. It's easier to see. And I think that's going to help everyone. Yep. Um, and next year, you don't have to go to more than one of those events. Now, if you don't qualify at one and you can travel, then maybe you want to have a crack at another one. But 
we're still sort of working it out with all the stakeholders and trying to make sure that it feel, everyone feels cool about that. But we don't want everyone to have to travel in the first half of next year. We just think that's improbable. Mm. It's we're, we're not wanting to sort of take that risk. We see the WSL pushing and thinking, rah, rah, rah. It's like, I hope it works for them. I yeah. do. But I don't really want to take that risk. So um, we don't have big financial pressure to do it either. Yeah. So the idea of having these structured national titles around the place means that everyone can still compete. Yeah. They just won't have as many international people coming. But it'll make it a strong national title. And then the idea of having the grand final is kind of cool, where everyone gets together. So if if it's IWT Grand Final only, then we'll have we'll limit the field to 32 riders, and you've got to qualify to get in. Now, about 24 of those will qualify from the tour, yeah. and then we'll have some wild cards. Now, and then we'll have 16 women and 16 youth and 16 masters. Now, the youth and masters heats are going to have to be uh, fast and furious, and it will depend on whether or not the Maui County gives us the approval for a window to accommodate that. A few details, but essentially that's the idea, and. If the PWA can raise the money, or we can raise the money with them, so that we can reach the thresholds for their professional prize money, um, we can draw all of that European big scene over to Maui again, like we did last year. We worked together in the same way. They brought Mercedes sponsorship and all of their team, which was awesome. And we can have we can expand that 32 bracket up to 48, exactly like we did last year. And that gives um, all of those riders plenty of opportunity to let anyone who's a serious contender into that event and that'll work. Yeah. Um, the other divisions will stay the same as they are and if the PWA do come they're going to be um, stressed about having um, 16 youth and 16 masters potentially taking away from the focus of the world title. Fair enough. So we'll only do the youth and masters if we can all manage to work out the timing and if we get a good window. Yeah. So logistics, details, but that's the plan and I'm pretty cool. sure that's how it'll work out. Cool, cool. I just realised I've got a, f a few other questions oh, yeah. on my phone, so I've got to go just run and grab my phone. However, while I'm doing that, I thought I'd ask you a question because yeah. maybe some people might be wondering about it since it happened not that long ago. But yeah. what was the story with the interview that uh, with uh, Burnt and uh, you know uh, regarding uh, on yeah. your social media that uh, blew up a bit? I'll just get my phone. You can keep talking. Oh, well, well, listen. Look, that that was um, uh, just. It's one of those things when you you know your role as a um, interviewing person, you're asking questions, and then you get answers that are obviously controversial. Um, now, of all of those questions, of tenish questions, nine of them were good questions and good answers and interesting stuff. The last question, um, Ban expressed a, a pretty high level of frustration, and uh, that came out as a sort of pretty uh, pr problematic thing. And uh, you know, Robbie Nash is a good guy. And I don't want to make anything funny about that. He is a good guy, and he has supported a lot of people for a long time through his efforts and his business acumen. And uh, he's now supporting uh, Ricardo Campello and Justina Ziadi, and they are outstanding sailors and doing outstanding stuff. So, you know, and and Robbie also stepped in to support the Aloha Classic at the end of last year, and uh, good on him. You know, we were really struggling to get the money together, and he helped Nash through him. So Robbie is a big supporter of the sport, and he's a big supporter of top riders, and he had a falling out with Van, which is a shame, and that's kind of all there is to it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Mm. Well, hopefully these things just blow over, right? I mean, uh, it's just something. They're both good people. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think as 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 the commentary on all those things were made very clear, Bantz, um he, you know, just lashed out and was a little bit. He overplayed his hand a little bit and was a bit too, you know, he he was upset. I mean. From his point of view, he was upset about a bunch of things, but so was Robbie. And so, business is business, and you've got yeah, to get things yeah, yeah. done. Yeah. I think I think those guys will be fine in the long run. I mean, they live on the same line. But Robbie Nash is such an interesting character uh, in the sport, isn't he? Because he's been there since day one, mm. well, pretty much, hasn't it? Like, and oh, and, and he's yeah. still relevant now. So it must be weird for him when you've got like young upstarts coming through throwing their weight around a bit when like from Robbie Nash's perspective he's seen it all done and all hasn't he? it's just like it must be a bit funny for him too I reckon well I the, th the thing about Robbie is that he knows what gold standard behavior is for, for an athlete because yeah. he, he's it yeah I mean there is ha there is and has never been an athlete in our sport who has handled himself professionally better than Robbie Nash mm. no it's just he is, he is the gold standard for anyone who wants to watch how to be how to behave no um, like you can't take the mongrel out of Robbie. He is a mongrel competitor. Like you put something competitive in front of him, and he will, 
people really try to win. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not like he's a polite, nice guy, you know, walking around with a halo over his head. I mean, he's an animal. But he's also, um, you know, a decent guy and good in business. Mm. And you don't stay good in business if you're awful to people. It just doesn't really work. Yeah, no, for sure. So he, he's handled himself really well. I mean, the fact that he speaks, learned to speak German so fluently, he, it's a very smart move. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's handled himself incredibly well. Yeah, so no, for anyone for sure. out there who's looking for, you know, how should I be, go back and watch how Robbie handled himself. Definitely, definitely. Uh, that was pretty crazy. Hmm. Um, yeah, okay, so other questions here. Look, Michael George, George, um, this question doesn't have to be answered. I apologize on his behalf. Why isn't the grand final held at the ultimate wave sailing venue in, in the world, Wanda? That's an excellent um, question, uh, George. Yeah. Um, obviously, Wanda being a beach break uh, with the large curving beach. With Wanda's the... in Sydney, by the way. It's just yeah. down the road. The waves are often this big, um, sometimes really big. Every now and then it's so big you can't get out. Um, well, Wanda's a lot of fun, we sail around here, but yeah, it's not gonna happen. Oh, it's a shame. Um, Sam Dillon, Sammy, oh, Sam. shout hey. out to Sammy. Hey, Sam. um, what can smaller clubs do to bring in more young blood as the dinosaurs become extinct? <laughs> That's an excellent question, Sam. <laughs> leaving, leaving out the dinosaur part of it. Um, the, uh, the, um, the young clubs can just offer free lessons. And, 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 and free gear, and they can talk to the schools and they can talk to the sporting associations around the schools and uh, just offer you know, free access uh, for a while. I mean, up to a point, you know, introductory free, and then if someone's interested, they can start sort of you know, chipping into the cost of things. I think that also tapping into sailing clubs, um, old school sailing clubs are still the bedrock organizing unit of sailing and learning to sail around Australia, and I think that's the single best place to do it. And otherwise, there are lots of sailing schools around. There's Balmoral, there's Rose Bay, um, there's uh, Botany Bay on the East Coast. And over in the West Coast, there's uh, Swan River. And there are plenty of places still around that teach people to windsurf. But if you want to tap into all the people where they are, these young kids have been introduced to little dinghies, and that's the place to go and poach them. Yeah, definitely. Well, just not poach, but give them an opportunity to do something you know, yeah. that's actually fun. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Like when you learn to windsurf, you're pretty much all doing on the same sort of gear. It's the big long board or some kind of beginner board, just on flat water mm. with five knots of wind. So it's kind of, mm. you know, that that's anywhere in the world. Like you know, just about anywhere in the world has that, mm. doesn't it? Mm. You know, a lake or a river or anything. So the opportunity to teach is actually a lot, isn't it? When you think about it, like there's heaps of places you could teach, but the, it's just. Yeah. Well, a, a classic example for me is watching the guys in Japan, like Hisa. Ishii. I mean, he's taught his own two sons to sail, and they're both extremely good. But he's taught so many people, and he's just done it out of sheer enthusiasm. Yeah. That's it. He's just passionate. Well, it's interesting. So, I was just thinking, because, you know, you're related to surfing. Like, in Australia, because we're, you know, whole country is sur essentially surrounded by waves, well, especially the top, the bottom half, um, heaps of opportunities to learn. But there's a lot of places in the world that don't have waves. I mean, you know, in Australia, you just think, oh, yeah, you know, you live somewhere and there's waves, but you think of how many countries out there don't have surf. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. most countries, you know, they're either landlocked or they're sort of part of the coastline where the waves are pretty crappy. Yet they'll probably all have a lake, or they'll, you know, like there's actually a lot of opportunities to yep. learn windsurfing, isn't it? More, more than you think. Huge like more than probably even just surfing, actually. But oh, way more. Yeah, yeah there's a lot like, more flat water than there is surf places. Exactly. So yeah. it's and yet it's, it's kind of untapped. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, just because the, the infrastructure is not there to get the... Well, we saw how big through. it could be in the 80s. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And they, that yeah. Was, the vast majority of windsurfing in the 80s was done on European lakes and rivers. Yeah. Vast majority. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's where it takes off. Which my mates give me crap about it, but I do think to watch that new windsurfer LT thing. Mm. Because, I mean, I know there's the foiling and all that sort of stuff, so it's different, but... I actually think that that formula of just a simple, relatively simple board with a simple sail is going to do more for getting people into windsurfing than anything else. Like it just, at the end of the day, it's it's simple and it's relatively inexpensive for clubs to get gear and stuff like that. It's right? the clubs getting gear that's the real key. Yeah. Yeah. Clubs yeah. buying a bunch of boards and then having regular organized fun days or little yeah. races. Um, that's what gets people out there because it's social and yeah. it's easy. Yeah, and it's also a board that you know you buy. It's not going to be outdated next year. You know, like there's all, there's all that equipment churn, which makes it hard. But that board just being yeah. one design, it's 
Mm. Yeah, I, I reckon watch that. I, I've got a feeling that that could get pretty big. Yeah, another one, Sammy. Um, for regional events, should there be an educational video on judging to avoid people getting scored for multiple wiggles and gay reels? Uh, or top yes. Bottom sailing? Sam, one of the things that we're working on right now is exactly that. Um, because the judging is such a constant thing and because nobody reads anymore, um, words aren't very helpful. So all these judging criteria, they're all written down, but people haven't read it all and they don't read it all. So we're going to make a video about it, which um, is really helpful. And that's what we do at before each event. We bring out the top sailors and, and videos that they have, and we play those videos with the judges for the event. And we talk about why one move, why you, we usually use a, a re-entry with one move that's right in the pocket, one move that's sort of this one and a half, two meters off the pocket. And we say, okay, judge it, tell us what you think. And most of them will judge it very, very close with points. And we say, no, 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 further apart. You, you need a bigger gap between right in the pocket and not. You need, yeah, yeah. You need to make that gap bigger. Yeah, true. And yeah. that's one of the things that's really straightforward. And one of the other really straightforward things is um, an aerial that's just someone flying down the line and then taking all the time in the world, only one maneuver, flying up here like this and then coming back down on the wave and going mega aerial. Like, true, it's a big aerial. But a mega aerial is going bottom turn, critical, tweak and down. That's a mega aerial. So the difference in points between the sliding air and the critical air is again spread out. So we're going to make a video, probably not of me doing this, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and that, that video will help us create a, a benchmark which everyone can then comment on, understand, we can tweak if we need to, and then that'll be our, that'll be our benchmark. And it'll give everyone a lot more confidence, and a lot more understanding, a lot more clarity. So yeah, the answer is cool. Right. That's right. Yeah. Another one from Sammy. Would a Jaws event be feasible or too much of a logistical nightmare? Excellent question, Sam. Um, we are effectively running a Jaws event now with the IWT Big Wave. And that contest was a digital one that we introduced last year at the beginning of 2019. And we handed out all the awards uh, on April 10th this year. And the way we did it, as you probably, most of you know, is we didn't try and put up tents on a headland with permits and hope we got it perfect because that's a mugs game for big web stuff. It's super hard to do. The WSL pulls it off with a lot of money and that's not what we've got and it's not really what we want to aim for. We want to aim for low cost because that's our reality. So our reality means that we've got a 2021 and, and we've got a, the season's running now as well, but we've got this uh, year long event, which is a digital event, which compresses into um, the winter on Maui. So everyone's there, all the top riders will be there for the Aloha Classic. So from October, November, December, January, February, March, that winter period where the big swells come through Jaws, and Jaws does dominate big wave riding. I mean, it just provides so much more access to ride those big waves than in so many other places. The whole world has big waves, but it's, it's a lot easier to ride very big waves at Jaws. P.I.E. So we're going to have an event which has this sort of six month window and we're du judging the best things that happen during that six months and then we're, we're awarding it afterwards. All on video. All on video yeah. or, f or photo. Oh, yeah. um, video is actually better in some ways to judge, but uh, you know, both are good. So yeah, cool. The, I mean, yeah. that's the answer. We're, we're running this flexible yeah. window. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Because if the other reality is, I mean, it's not like it's that much of a choice. If, if, if we said, let's do what the WSL does, and we, we said we want to we'll call it on when we can, or we'll have this arrangement with the Maui County, which is the approving government authority, uh, the mayor of Maui and all that sort of stuff, um, we would have a very hard time getting that permit approved without spending a lot more money than we have to spend. And it would just be too hard, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, that's yeah. exciting. Something to aim for one day, but yeah. Another for, now, one. for now, I think we're going to get the best out of this window. Thing. Another serious question from George. Um, I'm in the pro division of the New South Wales Wave Sailing Comp. How come I don't have any groupies? That's an excellent question, George. Um, yeah, I think the answer is you do have groupies, as you well know. We are all your groupies, George. <laughs> all of us. The problem with all these groupies is they're all men. <laughs> they're all male. That's right. Um, it's a bit of a disappointment. I'm not one of them, but. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that's a bit of a something else, isn't it? A lot of not a lot of um, 
opposite sex groupies at the moment. So much oh, being worked on. It's been like that for a long, long time. Oh, it's interesting when, when we when we started focusing our attention on building up the social media, because um, you, you know you get all these stats from social media and these. We were down around nineteen percent women compared to you know the rest men, and we've brought that up to thirty one percent women and sixty nine percent men. You know, give or take. Yeah. So. It's, we've improved it, like we're close to a third of women following us now, which is great. But uh, we would like to get it higher and we would like to have that start to reflect in participation. We don't have a third of our fleet is not women. Uh, we'd like it to be. Yeah. We'd like it to be 50-50. Yeah. But uh, we need to do more to get women for feeling sure, comfortable sure. about it and, and interested and engaged. It's super know. cool when you see women windsurfing actually. It's, yeah. Like, yeah, it's good to see, isn't it? Yeah. Sam Dillon, will the PWA stop being bell ends and let the guys do real wave events? Well, we've discussed this. I mean, the, <laughs> the PWA are not standing in the way of anything. They, they, they just are trying to raise money and keep leverage for those top riders to have value so that they can raise sponsorship money to pay them prize money and keep it all rolling yeah. along. Yeah, no. You know, they've, they've got that objective. And, that, and that's the PWA isn't some sort of, you know, boogeyman entity. I mean, they, they are the top riders trying to use themselves as a collective union to leverage. Yeah. So we support them. This next question is um, kind of, it's been directed more so towards me, but uh, it's from George again. I ride Ezzy sales because I used to work in a shop in WA that was the importer and I started just sailing them through them and then I've just supported them since. I, I just, you know, they're a solid sale. So but all the guys, most of the guys here ride Severn or um, or Sammy's on um, Point Seven and Dunks on Hot Sales. So there's a few other brands, but it's a running joke about me in the Ezzy sales. So this is the question from George: Are people allowed to sail Ezzy's in the IWT events, or do they have to have their own heavyweight competition? So, <laughs> Cheeky which bastard. is really unfair because <laughs> apparently bastard. I looked into it. The Ezzy's actually getting a lot lighter now. The the whole There's the whole way. thing about them being heavy is old old school. It's old. Oh, that's that's yeah. cruel, George. It's really cruel, isn't it? Ezzy's a great sales, just like all the others. He, like he, he jokes about it, but you know half the time he's swimming around with broken gear. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, okay. Let me just see if that's about it. Um, okay, Sammy, is it true it's okay to drop in if you shout party wave? Yep. Depends who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it for the questions. Okay, it's, just, cool. it's just going all downhill. <laughs> um, all right, well, to finish it up, because we've probably been talking a fair, fair while, but uh, what are you up to? Well, I, I've got a rough idea what you're up to because we're stuck in Australia now. Mm. Not a bad place to be. But um, you were mentioning something about uh, potentially getting a van or staying in Australia and yeah, maybe trying to go west or something. Like what's yeah. what's going on there? Well, um, my daughter finishes school at the end of this year in mid November ish, hopefully sooner. Um, and then she's finished high school and she's like done really well and that's great. So you know, my job as a dad is kind of thumbs up. And I've got my house on the market. I'm going to sell it and then I'm just taking off. I'm you know, freedom. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just charging, yeah, cool. uh, and just, she's taking off too. Like she's shucking surfboards on a full, on a, you know, she's getting some. Uh, I think half of Australia's buying a van at the moment. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, she, yeah. she wants the four wheel drive, so she's going to go that oh, way. Yeah, and she's cool. just going to take off into the sunset. She's going to have a great old time. And then I guess I will too. You know, I, I'm going to be going up and down the east coast here, sailing with Jess and with you guys, mm. picking up all the things. We're going to try and. I'm setting up a list of all the great places on the east coast to try and sail. I want to do all. Oh of them. yeah, nice. Yeah, Mate, cool. I'd join you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah cool. That's that's the goal, yeah, and then cool. I'll just have the laptop and everything else. Where we'll be running things, Russ and I. That's like, cool idea. Russ and Maui and me here, and just organising everything. Nice, nice. And then hopefully we can lead into you know a killer you know so version you might, of next year. So you might sail more than you have in a long time. I don't think so. I sell a lot on tour. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Road. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole. Mm. That's the whole sort of excitement. Yeah, and I just see because when I was in Peru, I just saw you there was so much you know behind the scenes stuff. I thought you know during the event that's true. During yeah. the event I barely sail at all. I barely get out for my own heats, but um. Before, Before and after, after. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, look, I think I don't know. Is there anything else you want to discuss? I mean, we've kind of covered a fair few things, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, I know right now it's probably not the best time to be talking about it. With you know, pretty much impossible to fly around. But if you ever got the opportunity 
to do an IWT event. Mm. Highly recommended. I've done one, like I said last year in Peru. I had a great time. And um, just really cool to meet other windsurfers around the world. Mm. You know, that's one thing I've sort of, you know, here we have windsurfers, but it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's limited, I guess, to a point. And you go overseas and there's people from all over the world doing this. It's weird. Like, you know, you meet, so, oh, you, you know, they windsurf in Argentina, do they? Oh, I've never met an Argentina. It's, it's cool, actually. And all those kids from Israel that came over. That yeah, heaps of people in Israel. It's like, yeah. geez, there's heaps yeah. of people there doing yeah, it. Brazil and... flew in, France flew yeah. in, Germans. Like, and it's just so super roots. cool to see the the stoke between everyone. Like everyone, yeah. at the end of the day, just like loves it. It's like, you know, it's you're not doing it for many, any other real reason, are you? It's no. Like, I mean, you you come off the water. Peru is a classic. You come off the water there, and you just cannot believe what you've just experienced. You just, mm. you just can't believe it. You know, mm. kilometer long waves. You're thinking, how does how did that actually happen? Did that really happen? Yeah. And then you come into the resort, and they hand you a pisco sour, and you sit around the pool, and you're lounging around. And you think, and the music's on. And you think, yeah, it's pretty good. It's awesome. Pretty good. Then you go into town, you come back, and you're happy you haven't been robbed. And very happy. It's yeah. really good. <laughs> uh, it's not that bad, but it was a couple of things happened. <laughs> no, it's cool. Well, um, Simeon, it's been awesome. Uh, thanks for participating in my first podcast. Yeah, good on you, Paul. And, and good on first... you for making all the videos because everyone loves them. They're oh, hilarious. yeah. No, thanks, mate. Yeah. Especially that dubbed one with the guy speaking Spanish. That's just. Oh, my God. Which one? Oh, the. The, um, How they fuck up windsurfing? Uh, the what's it called? The Point Break one? No, the, oh. that, was, that one's funny. Oh, that's the Rositas. The Rositas, the Rositas <laughs> one. I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. know. It's funny, isn't it? But no, it's, uh, thanks heaps, Simeon. And I'm um, not sure who I would get next time. This is going to be completely random. It might not be another two years before the next one. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching, guys. And mm. I'll catch you next time. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Paul. You. This year, my experience in the tent here in Baja was pretty hardcore, I would say. I mean, the guy, he put his camp on the top of the cliff. I filled the tent really close to my face. <laughs> it was like... In the full speed of the wind, which blew for about 20 hours a day, his tent was like this shape. I so I don't know how he slept with it. Here in Peru are really important for me. That's also why I wanted to, you know, stay alone and prepare myself like a thousand percent for the contest. Things are time. Phew!